All right, now formally call this meeting to order. Would our city clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio. Councilwoman Gallego. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Valenzuela. Here. Councilman Waring. <clears throat> Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Pastor. Here. Mayor Stanton. Here. Uh, we're fortunate to have an interpreter with us today, Ms. Garcia. Please introduce yourself. One more time, with, yeah, the mic wasn't working there, unfortunately. My apologies. Uh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es María eh, García y soy un intérprete del idioma español. Aquellas personas que vayan a necesitar los servicios de un intérprete, a cualquier momento durante esta reunión, por favor, déjenmelo saber a mí o a la Secretaría Municipal o al personal. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Now we have citizen comments. Citizens have up to three minutes to uh, provide any comments they want on non-agendized items. City Council cannot provide uh, substantive responses to it because it is non-agendized items. The first speaker under citizen comment is Mr. Richard Tamayo. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Richard Tamayo. I'm the senior pastor of God's Army. I'm here to discuss an issue that's taken place in the city of Phoenix, and it has to do with the homeless community and the people out there. These are people that are sheep without a shepherd, and they want to start speaking out about the abuse in the police departments. They feel they're being, that there's an ethnic cleansing that's going on out there, the way Sheriff Joe Arpaio was trying to ethnically clean the city of Arizona or the city of Phoenix when he went up against the illegal immigrants. Now, you'll have a couple of testimonies coming before you to testify. But I'm here to explain that these people will no longer stand by to be abused. They've already lost everything. They're homeless. They have nothing but to fight for the rights to be heard, and they're tired of the abuse. I'm here to state that God's army will be representing homeless people throughout this valley. They feel being ethnically cleansed and pushed throughout other cities. Well, God's army is going to be retrieving every homeless person that's out there in every other city and bringing them to Phoenix, Arizona. We will be occupying and encamping on Shadow Mountain. Shadow Mountain has been the holy mountain that God's army has been praying for throughout years. In 2007, we put a cross on there like the Marines did with the, when they put the American flag on Iwo Jima. In 2008, I myself was addressed by the police and it was police encounter when I placed a cross up there with other members of God's army. I was threatened with arrest and also with trespassing. I have documentation of letters that have been gone back and forth through the Phoenix Legal Department, and that issue was addressed. So throughout years, now 10 years, even till date, we have been using this mountain as a holy mountain. The way Moses brought the people of Israel to Mount Sinai to seek God's face, that's what we will be doing with God's army when we occupy and encamp this mountain, Shadow Mountain. The location of this mountain is 13613 North Cape Creek Road, which stands behind a church called Dream City Church. We have no affiliations with the church. I'm here to tell you that we are not asking for permission. We are not going to be applying for permits. It will be an occupier like you had in Wall Street. I hope that the chief of police, Williams, has the department new training so that when they deal with this incident or whatever you want to call it, because we'll be staying there for 40 days and 40 nights, seeking God's face as a church, God's army. Now, we have two divisions. We have those that wear the uniform that I am wearing, which is a full blue uniform. We're all prior military and law enforcement. And then you have the other division that are homeless. They, we will see the uniform when they step up. They wear fatigue pants, and they wear a shirt that's gray in color with the word Jesus in the front, name Jesus, and the name God's army in the back. If the city of police and the city of Phoenix continue to harass our members when they're in uniform, it will be an act where God's army will now be put in battle formation. These people are tired. Protesters are tired. You will hear further testimony later on that they don't want weapons of, uh, that are used in military warfare. Thank you very much for your testimony. Three minutes, three minutes per person. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for the information. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Tamayo. How about Tyler Richards? And then followed by Georgia Watson. Hello, my name is Hello, my name is Tyler Andrew Richards, and I am here today on behalf of hundreds and hundreds of homeless people in the Phoenix area. Um, I have been homeless for seven years. I'm a captain in God's Army, and I just want to just restate exactly what Richard mentioned, uh, the unnecessary abuse, the unnecessary harassment, the unnecessary discrimination that we go through. I mean, it's hard enough to find employment homeless, but now it's to the point where it's like we can't even exist. We're constantly being trespassed for absolutely no reason. I mean, as far as, I'm, as far as I know, trespassing is five minutes or longer, and if you purchase something, it should be 30 minutes or longer. Uh, I've sat down for 30, min 30, 30 seconds and been pushed off and moved around, you know. Uh, that's <laughs> pretty much all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, coming down and providing that testimony. How about uh, Georgia Watson? Did you want to go next? And then followed by Franklin uh, Olivieri. Hello, I'm Georgia Watson, captain of, the, of God's Army. I haven't been homeless uh, but for a short time, but I've met a lot of very nice people that are homeless and listen to their stories, and I'm here to represent them as well as myself, God's Army. I'm a little nervous. I can't believe it took to be homeless to speak at a council meeting. But, but yes, people are tired. And um, just to, I've, I've been homeless for a little over a month and I've had to move. The police have asked me to move uh, four times. Um, they, they, if they get a call, then you, uh, they have to come. They have to uh, follow up and uh, make you move, and I, um, I'm not living with just a backpack yet. I have things haven't, that I haven't parted with, and, um, you know, and then I don't know exactly where I'm gonna go, and um, I've spent money in the area that I'm homeless, that I'm just kind of wandering around in, and I mean, where I went to the grocery store or the, or the um, pharmacy, and um, and I know some of these people know me, but they act like they don't because I'm homeless now. So anyway, um, I may be homeless, but I'm. I'm still a child of God, a U.S. citizen, and I do have rights. And I just don't want to, one of my favorite sayings comes from the Bible. You treat people like you want to be treated. Do unto others as you would have, as they would do unto you. And uh, that's the way I've treated people my whole life the way I want to be treated. So if you could put yourself in our shoes for a moment, because it could happen at any time. Homeless, uh, when you become homeless, it happens that quick. Sometimes you don't see it coming. And um, so the next time just made me remember that because uh, it could happen to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Watson, for coming down that uh, testimony. I've asked the city manager if you'd be open-minded to it, uh, to allow our human services department to at least talk to you about some op service uh, options. Our strategy and philosophy here at City of Phoenix is to lead with services for people that are experiencing homelessness. Franklin Olivieri, please come forward. You have up to three minutes to provide testimony. You're okay? Okay, next would be then Mr. Pat Vint. Did you provide testimony? You wanna do it now? Okay, please come forward. Some, some. Get this thing to work. And I would rather not use the microphone if that's possible because it doesn't work. It's just a bunch of local stuff that I see. And so I was asked by a wonderful lady up there in the floral group, asked me to be respectful today. 
pretty hard for me to do, so I thought I would just give a little humor, and she said that would be okay as long as I just use my three minutes. Three minutes. So if you all remember back in history, New Orleans was built, probably the first city in the United States that built underwater, under sea level. So there was a rabbit, a lizard, and a turtle that lived there, and they said they can't stand this, so they decided they'd go west. So they all headed to Texas. Sure enough, they got in the middle of Texas, and here's all this beautiful dry land. They could plant anything, which they did. Well, anyway, they didn't have machinery, so they decided one of them would have to go back to New Orleans, get some farming machinery. So they decided they'd send a rabbit because a turtle or a lizard would take forever. So the rabbit went. Well, while the rabbit was gone, there was a rock or something laying there kind of dark and they picked it up and it was kind of black. So they looked around and it got blacker and wetter and nasty. Well, it ended up they discovered oil in Texas. So hell, they built this big castle and everything and they had, they had uh, maids and whatever you call those people, maids, butlers, everything. So the rabbit came back, knocked on the door, I said, I don't understand what's happened. Is the rabbit or is the turtle and the lizard here? Oh, yes. Mr. Lazard is out in the yard. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Turtel, he's out by the well. So I said, uh, would you inform them that Mr. Ribbit is back at the that's all the humor I got for today. <laughs> but what I'd like to do, if I've got some time, is have somebody ask them this new article that a wonderful lady named Jessica Bonner wrote. And it's about the city of Phoenix being $4.4 billion in debt. Not billion, not million, hundred, four point one. $4.4 billion. And the reason that is, is the past, now I, I want to try to be nice, but we had two prior city managers to Ed Zirko over there, Frank Fairbanks and David Cavazos. So when they retired, they spiked their walk out the door pay, said they never took a vacation the entire 20 years we were here. Never used a driver, which they're Number one, they could have a driver, take them anywhere. Thank you very much, Mr. Bent. Thanks for your testimony very much. Um, the next speaker on public comment will be Michelle Dene. Is that correct? Please come forward. It's important to use the microphone so folks at home who are watching maybe on television can see it's up to you, Pat, whether you want to use it or not. But if in order for the folks at home to hear the testimony providing it's important to use the microphone. Good to see you. Thank you. Actually, Denae is the French Canadian, so my ancestors thank you for that. But anglicizing it, it's Denny. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Vice Mayor, and Council members. I found out the other day that due to operator error, the talking points that I emailed you all did not reach you. So I have handouts, or I can go ahead and resend everything. My background experience includes 16 plus years of serving as a county land use planner. Thank you. I know that what may be considered a good and sound ordinance may not be so good and sound and needs to be amended. Based on what is transpiring with the hoarding ordinance and how the Humane Society and city detectives are interpreting the wording and not the intent, clarification needs to be made. There are many who are or will be affected by the hoarding ordinance and how it is currently being used. Many are afraid to speak out given what they heard may or does happen with the Humane Society and the city detectives. It's that nighttime banging on the windows that brings fear into your heart. And fear is a powerful weapon. In fact, many advised me, not, many advised me to keep my mouth shut because they feared the consequences with informing you, the council, of what will happen and what was happening and the need to readdress the hoarding ordinance. I will not remain silent. 
I cannot remain silent. There needs to be a clarification of the intent of Section 8-3.09. Just because we rescue pets and are caring for more than nine should not identify us as hoarders, and yet that is what we are being accused of, and we're being treated like criminals to boot. Because of what happened with us and others, I now know the feeling of hate and mistrust for the government and others associated with the government, and I'm a public servant by heart. I don't like that feeling. I know better, and yet, I want you to believe that the city will work with me and others to improve the implementation of an ordinance that currently is being used to instill fear in a specialized segment of the community. There has to be an open line of communication with those of us who are, one, foster home-based pet rescues, two, independent pet rescuers, three, small-scale pet sanctuaries, and four, families who have a number of pets who are treated like family. This will enhance the intent of the hoarding ordinance as the city meant it to be. I offer my work experience and knowledge to assist in better defining the intent of what the city of Phoenix wanted. Right now it's apparent to many in the rescue community that we are to be shut down one by one. I hope thank you for your testimony. Thank you, I hope to continue. And we, have your written, we have your written uh, testimony. We'll make sure it's presented for the record. Thank you so much. Uh, how much time do we have? One more. Okay, Mr. Leonard Clark, did you provide testimony now? Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Leonard Clark. I appreciate you letting me speak here, and uh, I appreciate the comments of all of the folks that are showing up here today. It's important, even though the meetings are held at this time of the afternoon. Um, I'm here because I'm concerned about the homeless policy and the Phoenix Light Rail Transit. I'm going to speak on the police issues, the petition when that comes up. But um, I believe that there is a vi possible, no, actually probable violation of civil rights when you tell people after they pay their fare that you're watching them, they get on the light rail, they get off, they can't get back on again. You're saying you're trying to encourage using public transportation, but I just feel that that's not right when you say that because you're discouraging it. I think it's a violation of civil rights and they're telling people on the light rail who we fund, uh, this Valley Transit, uh, they're telling them that, no, we may not be able to ticket you, you're not committing a criminal offense, but we are going to use our own arbitrary judgment. But I believe that's just another way of saying you're poor, you don't look like us, and we don't want our tourists to see that. Now, my second thing, and I'll quickly finish, is the pension system. I'm not speaking about the hardworking city of Phoenix workers who on average make about $30,000 a year on their pensions. I'm talking about retired city managers, police chiefs, police commanders, pulling in $100,000, 150000 a year when they retire, taking 200000 So we do have to do something. I don't want us to end up like Detroit. And then finally, you know, this whole water crisis, Cape Town, South, A South Africa, they're set to run out of drinking water in May. This is foolhardy what is going on. I ask that you please instruct the legislature and the governor to stop the process of getting rid of what wise people in the 80s did to preserve our groundwater. It's not infinite. The developers have no right to take away what's left of our water. We are a city that lives in the middle of a desert. So I'm asking that, that you please check into that. The pension system, I would support the current initiative. Unfortunately, though, we need to look at, it's unfair in, the, in this system where certain people can make $120,000 a year. Yes, they're top level, and yes, they do give us good advice, but the garbage man out there, the hardworking person who goes and fixes our cable at 3 in the morning in freezing weather, their work is no less important. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clark, for that testimony. There are a couple other cards here for individuals wishing to speak on citizen comment. We will reserve time at the end of today's meeting for that, but under our rules, we have 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting for citizen comment. We'll now move on on our agenda. Uh, would the city clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. 
ordinances number G6419 through 6421 and S44258 through 44295. Thank you very much. Now I'll do uh, approval of previous meeting minutes. Council Waring, you were continued uh, from a previous meeting, the special meeting minutes from December 20th, 2017. Have you had a chance to review those meeting minutes? I uh, move to approve. There's a motion, there is a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Count, uh, Vice Mayor, formal meeting minutes, January 24th, 2018. I move approval for January 24th, 2018 minutes. There's a motion, there's a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next we'll move on to board and commission nominations. Vice Mayor, is there a motion on boards and commissions? Mayor, motion to approve mayor's boards and commission nominations. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Council member boards and commissions? Uh, motion to approve the city council boards and commission nominations. There's a motion, there is a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. It appears that there are many citizen leaders here to be sworn in for uh, board service. I'll come down to the floor and do that. And then would ask that those citizen leaders to come behind the dais when completed so that individual council members can thank you in advance for your service. Please raise your right hand. I and state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the office of according to the best of my ability. So help me God. You're official. Thank you for your service. We appreciate it very much. Just please walk back there. Good to see you. Our thank you in advance for that important service to the citizens of Phoenix. Next on our agenda, liquor license applications. Vice Mayor. Uh, motion to approve items 5 through 18, except for item 5 and 18. Okay, there's a motion in favor. Uh, there is a second. So we've held out 5 and we've held out 18. There's a motion, there's a second. There are two cards, but both in favor of the motion. Any comments by members of this council? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Those pass unanimously. Item number five is in Councilman DeCicio's district, but I understand he has given uh, his suggested motion to Councilwoman Stark, so he'll be prepared at the right time for that. There are two cards, both in favor of the Application, Councilman Stark, do you want to make a motion? Uh, yes, thank you. I move to approve item five. Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, the two individuals wishing to speak, Daniel Suh, the applicant, and Lawrence Jer Jerry, in light, of the, in light of the motion, do you wish to provide testimony? Yes. You do want to provide testimony? Uh, just real quick. Please come forward. Either one. 
so I'm, I'm Daniel Stutt. I spoke uh, last, uh, the last meeting. Uh, I just wanted to make it short and sweet. We did take a lot of proactive steps from the last meeting. We also took a lot of proactive steps before to really educate the, uh, the different residents that spoke before. I will say uh, there's a lot of context that was missing when they made their issues, and we sent that letter to uh, uh, Councilman DeCicio. But really, the, I'd say if I were to summarize that context is that uh, the, while the lot is adjacent to the houses, uh, we, it's a very big lot, and we're actually on the southern border. So we're, and there's also a 12,000 square foot two-story office building between us and the actual uh, neighborhood. And so uh, we, I know sound was the biggest issue and I just wanted to bring that up, but uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be, it's probably over exaggerated the impact. And we've talked to uh, sound engineers, police officers, different people of the community to make sure that we can, we, we, we can act in, as a reasonable and good neighbor and steward. Thank you very much. Any questions for the applicant? All right, there's a motion in favor of the uh, license for Provision Coffee Bar. There is a second. Any comments by the council? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is item number 18, which was continued from February 7th. It's in Councilwoman Gallego's district. There are cards on this item. Uh, we do have a Phoenix police officer provide testimony. We also have Mr. Brookings. I think it's the same individuals that spoke at our last meeting. Councilman Gallego, how would you like to proceed? Let's hear from our officer and then the applicant. All right, Officer Smart. And obviously, uh, Officer, you gave a very thorough uh, report last time uh, as well, and we appreciate that. And so, I don't know if you want to update us any any new information. Yeah. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Um, in the last two weeks, we were able to meet with the applicant, Mr. Brookins. Uh, he was unable to provide us any financial information showing that uh, Mr. Love or his wife are not financing the club. Um, we also were able to do a liquor inspection at the restaurant depot where they're buying, purchasing their alcohol. Um, Mr. Love and his wife are both on that um, ability to buy alcohol at Restaurant Depot along with one of the applicants, Mr. Jenkins. I was able to contact the landlord for the building and he informed me the only people that they've dealt with are Mr. and Mrs. Love, the hidden owners. Um, I was able to look it up on the Corporation Commission and Mr. Love's wife is the statutory agent on the forms for Corporation Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the bottom line is uh, the police department's uh, opposition to license stands. Correct. Okay, thank you so much. Mr. Brooking, uh, good to see you. Did you provide, uh, you also did provide substantive testimony uh, last time. Let's see, Leon Brooking. Yes, sir. Oh, there you are, okay, good. Did you wish to provide additional testimony to this council? Yes. Good to see you. Good Up to two minutes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, nice to see you again. Um, we did meet yesterday, Mr. Smart, uh, Officer Smart, and myself. And uh, at that meeting, they brought up Mr. Love's wife, which was new information to us. At the time of the first application, the only person they were concerned with was Mr. Love. We have since removed Mr. Love. The reason why Mr. Love is on the application at the kitchen depots because they put in the initial application for us for the post 86. We also discussed uh, guilt by association. I was given an example where I was told even though I'm a 23 year veteran of the United States Air Force, if I had 26 friends that were criminals and gang members and such, then I'm guilty by association because of the acts of their own what I failed to understand is if I've never committed a crime in my life, why am I guilty for other people's actions? That's basically telling me I'm guilty for being black in America, or I'm guilty for driving black in a white neighborhood, or I'm guilty for walking in a, in a store with a Houston Astros hat on, all of a sudden I'm a Hoover Crip. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I've served 23 years for freedoms, basic freedoms that basically every person in this office, in this audience, lives by. I've done my due diligence. I've paid my dues. 
I should be given a chance to change the minds of young black men in the south side of Phoenix, Arizona, who have seen nothing but corruption and, you know, disparity. Now, all I'm trying to do is basically change the viewpoint of America, change the viewpoint of disabled veterans who feel disgruntled on the south side of Phoenix. And the only way I can do that is through American Post 86. This liquor license is a hassle, by far. And I, I understand that Officer Smart and Officer Doherty have to do their due diligence, but complacency and past experiences are not my problem. Now, if they want to question me, they you know I was basically told I could be a bought man because of my financial background. If I was a bought man, I would have never made it in the military. So I'll leave it like this, sir. Uh, if given the chance, I will change the community. I have outstanding people behind me, backing me right now. And I will definitely work with Officer Smart and Officer Doherty so we can clear up those, those information that they need. Thank you. Right, thank you very much for your uh, uh, testimony. It should be noted that uh, this body is only a recommending body to the state liquor board. Uh, they take our, uh, our recommendations under advisement uh, and don't always follow our recommendation. But our job is, this is not a criminal trial, obviously, here. This is simply whether this city council is going to recommend a liquor license or not for this particular establishment. Councilwoman. I move uh, disapproval of item 18 based on the police department's recommendation for disapproval due to concerns about the applicant's possible hidden ownership and affiliation to gang activity. The applicant has not demonstrated the capability, qualifications, and reliability to hold and control a liquor license. Okay, Leonard Clark, did you provide testimony? So just a second, there's a motion in opposition. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Clark, did you provide testimony on this uh, item? Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I've heard the gentleman speaking. I get paid not one penny from anybody. I don't represent any liquor licensees, but I've heard this gentleman speaking, and I don't believe it's fair for you. I hope that you will vote in favor. I disagree with the police department here, and I do see a little shade of racism going on here. I'm a veteran. I want this gentleman to have a chance in the city of Phoenix. He's not some big corporation. He's not Walmart. He's not Walgreens. Give this man a chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clark. Okay, there's a motion in opposition based upon the testimony of the Phoenix Police Department and their investigation. There is a second. Any comments by members of this council? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. The motion for disapproval passes unanimously. Again, that will provide a full hearing before the uh, State Liquor Board where they can go in a lot more detail about the evidentiary issues, but the recommendation from this council will be for disapproval. Okay, moving forward with our agenda. Next on the agenda are ordinances, resolutions, new business, planning, and zoning. Vice Mayor, do we have an omnibus motion? City Clerk, are you ready, ready for the ordinance resolutions, uh, new business and planning and zoning? All right, is, is there okay. a proposed motion? Motion to approve items 19 through 90, except the following. 35, 47, 48, 52, 54, 61, and 87 through 90, and 51, I forgot 51. Item 36 is requested to be continued to March 7, 2018, and excluding these items for public comment. 36, 47, 51, 61, 87, 88, and 90. That is our proposed omnibus motion. Is there a second? There is a second. There are there any cards on those items? Oh, there is a card? Okay. Any comments from members of this council? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. 
Williams? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Mayor Stanton? Yes, so those items pass unanimously. Uh, Vice Mayor has a request to take one item out of order today. Mayor, I would like to take item 61 out of order and move it to the front. There is a motion for 61, take it out of order. Is there a second? second. There is a second, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes, so now we'll be on item 61. Item 61 concerns Terminal 3 Food and Beverage Retail Revenue Contract uh, Award. There are a few cards on the uh, item. The staff uh, has made the recommendations. There's not a motion on that yet, but that will be what we'll take testimony on is the proposed staff recommendation, unless someone would prefer that we to put a motion on the floor before we take citizen comment, either way. Councilman Williams, please. I believe this went through our subcommittee and uh, it was a long time going through the subcommittee and it is something that was uh, thoroughly vetted and I would move approval. Second. There's a motion in favor. There is a second. All the cards appear to be uh, in favor of the proposal, so it's up to you whether you still want to provide testimony or not, but I'll give you that option at this time. Mr. Bruce Mosby, did you provide testimony before the City Council? Good to see you. How about uh, Richard Cesar? Okay. Richard De Leon, Ricard, excuse me, Ricardo De Leon. Please come forward. Dr. Ann Hart, Dr. Hart, where are you? There you are. It's up to you whether you will provide testimony or not. Nor, uh, Nara Singham right, says, if necessary, I'll let you decide if it's necessary or not. And then Mr. Kerwin Brown is the uh, final one. So it's up to you whether you want to provide testimony or just go with your card for the record. Uh, Mr. DeLeon, good to see you. Up to two minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, City Staff, Aviation Team, and EOD, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to continue being a part of the Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport retail. I applaud what you've done for the local business and suppliers. It means a lot when the local people see that your selection process is fair and that they have a shot at being part of this enterprise. We also, as, part, as your partner, source local suppliers that not only can sell their products to our, lo our locations at Sky Harbor, but by partnering with companies such as Hudson Group, they now have the possibility to sell their products nationally. Enhancing our local economy, increasing jobs, and creating a fair competitor's edge, otherwise hard to achieve. I am proud of being a member of this community and proud to consider myself part of Phoenix Car Harbor International Airport, and along with my partner, Melissa Trujillo, who are the local minority partners with Hudson Group at Car Harbor. Thank you. Thanks for that testimony and good luck getting your products sold around the country. That's great. Hope that works out well. Dr. Ann Hart, great to see you. Good to be here. Thank you. And good afternoon, Mayor Stanton, Vice Mayor Laura Pastora, and Phoenix and City Council men and women. My name is Dr. Ann Hart, and I come here before the City Council meeting today as a celebratory concerned member of the Maricopa County community. In reference, in reference to this, I would first like to thank the City Council. Uh, Vice Mayor Laura Pastor and Phoenix City Council men and women. I want to thank the PAB, the Phoenix Airport Board, as well as the aviation staff for providing transparency and appropriate oversight and awarding the contract to support diversity and inclusion and minority and small businesses, food and beverage and retail concessions at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport, Terminal 3. As a frequent traveler of the airports, it feels great to be a part of a city that provides opportunities for minorities and small businesses to grow in the Sky Harbor Airport retail concessions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind testimony, uh, Dr. Hart, and your community leadership. Uh, Kerwin, did you wish Kerwin Brown? Good afternoon. Um, Dr. Hart actually took some of my thunder, but I'll, I'll speak anyway. I, um, a couple years ago, I had uh, the opportunity to have a meeting with uh, Councilman Valenzuela, with, uh, with uh, Director Bennett, and uh, kind of expressed my, that I was disgruntled about the diversity uh, that uh, was seen in the airport. Obviously, when people fly into Sky Harbor, that is a, uh, 
uh, it should be anyway, a reflection of the entire city. And I didn't think it was. To their credit, and I want to thank the council, I want to thank the um, Aviation Board and Director Bennett for uh, what I have seen thus far uh, provided for Terminal 3. And uh, I wanted to just have the opportunity to come and say thank you. Uh, thank you to the council, thank you to the Aviation Board, thank you to Director Bennett, and uh, it is my sincere hope that the efforts are continued. Thank you very much uh, for those kind comments, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, there are many other cards not wishing to speak, individuals not wishing to speak. Uh, I'm going to make sure they're all in favor. If not, I'll give anybody who's not a chance to speak. All right, it appears they are all in favor, so I'll submit them for the, uh, uh, for the record. So the motion is in favor of the professional staff recommendation based upon the uh, procurement process. There is a second. I now turn to members of the council, see if there are any comments from members of the council. Councilman Gallego, please. Thank you. There's going to be some exciting new tastes coming to the airport as well as new shopping opportunities, which is very exciting. I think the whole council has heard strong feedback about how much people like what's been happening in Terminal 4 and that's coming to more and more of the airport, so lots to look forward to at Sky Harbor. At the beginning of this meeting, we had some uh, very moving testimony about the impact of homelessness on the community, and there's also several partners who are uh, winning awards today who have been great about reaching out to our at-risk populations and trying to hire people who've maybe had some, some bumps in their past, including people who've been impacted by homelessness. Um, some of the partners today are also our partners on My Brother's Keeper and have been actively trying to recruit uh, young people, including young people who live around the airport where we have some real pockets of unemployment and some, some tough statistics about the number of young people who are neither working nor in school. So that means a lot to, to me as a council person that um, our partners care about our city priorities and, and addressing some of the challenges that face Phoenix. Um, there are also several applicants who uh, are partners on equal pay, trying to close the pay gap between men and women, and I really appreciate that. There was one applicant whose answer to the question about equal pay was, um, I will try to close the pay gap by putting up a poster in the workroom, and so that was not the answer I was looking for, but I understand they did better in the interview than um, in the written application, but overall, a uh, very exciting opportunity for the city of Phoenix, and congratulations to those recommended. Thank you very much. Any other members of the council want to provide testimony? Councilman Alkowski, please. Where I've been on the council for over 10 years, I remember Terminal 4 coming to us, and one of the things that we fought for is making sure that there was local participation, and not just local participation, but also minority participation. I know Council Member Johnson and myself, we fought for that. I know that my other colleagues on the council back then, we have um, former member um, Claude Maddox that's in the audience. He also was very supportive, and Delta Williams. And we've created a trend. And now hopefully that trend from Terminal 4 goes to Terminal 3, and our future terminals and will be the same that will mirror what the face of Phoenix is all about. But not just the face of Phoenix, but also the taste of Phoenix. Because that's what we're unique about, flying into Sky Harbor, is the restaurants and the food that we have. So I just really want to thank all those colleagues of mine that really fought and the, the colleagues that are sitting at the table right now that continue this tradition. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. Councilman Valenzuela, please. I want to thank all of the uh, participants. I, it's incredibly exciting. Kerwin Brown, is Mr. Brown still here? Thank you. If, if he left. Uh, I want to thank Kerwin because I remember the meeting we had in my office. I, I'm blessed with the responsibility to, to chair the, the Downtown Aviation Innovation uh, Subcommittee. And uh, Kerwin had some concerns. And I also want to give Jim Bennett, who is here, uh, a lot of credit because he he took the meeting like he always does. And uh, we had some of those conversations to my colleague's point. You know, these conversations have been had for a very long time. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, those who responded to the RFP and in particular those who, who won uh, these opportunities and responsibilities uh, to serve at, at Phoenix Sky Harbor, you, you answered the, the call. 
So there is more diversity uh, worked in. Uh, there are more reflections of our local community uh, at the airport, and that will continue. So I want to thank you for stepping up. Thank you for uh, investing in our city and our state and the people, most importantly, the people of our uh, city and our state. You know, th these are jobs that are being provided and families that are being uh, supported. So uh, it's, it's incredibly exciting. Uh, we, we got here without, without any protests. So uh, that's always a good thing. And uh, I just would like to congratulate uh, all of those who, uh, who will be awarded after this vote, I assume. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Councilman. Councilwoman Stark. Yes, Mayor, I just wanted to thank um, everyone that was involved. And Sky Harbor really is special because of all the, the local businesses, the local restaurants. And I also want to say happy birthday to Lauren Bailey. All right. Oh. <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> That's great. That's a logo. She's a great business. All right. Uh, Vice Mayor, please. She is a local, local business person and the whole group is, and what I get the pleasure of representing District 4, where uh, three of those restaurants land in oh, District 4. We're so, all gonna fight for Lauren Bailey uh, now on her birthday. So I'm very proud of that. And uh, what I'm very proud of uh, most of all is that we uh, keep our local flair and our local business as part of our airport, uh, and in combo with the diversity that uh, represents our city within the airport. And so um, congratulations. Uh, to Jim Bennett to getting to this point without a protest. Uh, he probably, I don't know if this is his first one or not, but uh, they're few, right, Jim? And so uh, congratulations and all to the airport staff for getting here. Uh, I also want to uh, recognize and understand that uh, those that are employed with the airport are coming, mainly come from many working families, which uh, happen to be, I know this, uh, which happens to be a lot of those families live in District 4. And so I know those families on the west side uh, that appreciate working for our city, but also working for the airport. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, um, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, Councilman Gallego, some additional uh, comments? Uh, Council, the Vice Mayor inspired me, so I have a constituent who's celebrating his birthday as well, so happy birthday to, to Kurt Mangum. <laughs> well, do right, we need to sing happy much. birthday? I'm not going to fight for <laughs> Kurt Mangum. <laughs> Anyone else celebrating birthday today? Anniversaries. I'll take Lachelle. <laughs> yeah, we'll fight for Lachelle. And then I <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And I just want to say, uh, so first off, it's not a requirement that it be your birthday to be awarded an airport uh, <laughs> contract. I'll make sure it's clear for anybody watching at home. Uh, there's no unfair advantage in that regard. On a serious note to uh, Mr. City Manager and to uh, Jim Bennett, uh, these airport procurements are incredibly competitive. Uh, and so we have some very, very talented uh, businesses and entrepreneurs and restaurant leaders that are uh, being recommended for approval uh, uh, for, for the uh, Terminal 3 food and beverage uh, contract. There are some very talented business people and restaurateurs that are not being recommended here today. And what's important to note is that they're not here in opposition. And it's a testament to uh, the professionalism and the fairness of the procurement system that we utilize through Phoenix Sky Harbor uh, Airport. It hasn't always been this way. We've had some really knockdown drag outs on some previous uh, airport procurement uh, processes. So I just want to publicly say thank you for doing it the right way uh, and for selecting these outstanding businesses and making sure that even those that were not recommended here today felt like the process was fair. And that's what a great city uh, does. So today is a really successful in that regard. And I too want to congratulate those that are being recommended uh, today. Uh, the, the airport is the front door to the city. It's our biggest economic uh, engine. Terminal 3, of course, we are investing $600 million in as we speak. And so it will be become an incredibly busy and even busier uh, terminal uh, over time and making sure that our visitors to our community get the very best service when they enter that airport or where they're waiting for their flights back home is incredibly important for the perception that we leave. And so this procurement process is important. Yes, we want to work with established successful businesses, but we also want to take a risk on some new businesses, give them a shot, uh, give them their opportunity uh, inside one of the busiest airports uh, in America and make sure that 
uh, the diversity that we're blessed to have in Phoenix is represented in the business opportunities that go on at our airport. And I think that this, uh, these recommendations reflect and balance out all of those interests very, very successfully. So again, uh, congratulations to Jim Bennett and team, uh, and also to congratulate those that are being recommended here today. With that, any other final comments? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, so the uh, motion passes unanimously. We'll no move back to our regular order of our agenda. Vice Mayor. I'm at 35, okay, because I'm looking at the paid or ordinances. Uh, item 35, move approval. There's a motion and a second on 35. Any comments by members of this council? Cards. Any cards? Is there a card on 35? No. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, yeah, so the motion passes seven to one. Next item on the agenda is item 36. 36. And it, uh, there's a request to continue, but I understand there's cards. Okay, so there's a motion to continue. Is it the March 7th, 2018? Yes, March 7th, 2018, correct. Is there a second? There is a second, and I understand there is a card in opposition to continuing item uh, 36. Uh, two cards uh, on that item, Jose de Jesus Rivera, as well as Paul Levine. Did you provide testimony for this council? Council and council, council members, my name is Paul Levine. I'm with DV Towing. We object to the continuance of the consideration of this matter. Um, the award recommendation was originally made on October 11. We are almost four and a half months after that date. There were two active protests filed by All City Towing. The first on October 19, 2017, which was denied. A second matter was taken to the administrative law judge who rendered an informed and very detailed opinion. There is nothing new factually or substantively with any of the issues in this case that will be brought before this, uh, either the city or to the city council. The delay only um, perpetuates this, this uh, treadmill that we're on. The city has given very detailed recommendations about why it believes the award should be confirmed. The city knows the procurement process. It spent a considerable amount of time preparing the RFP, preparing uh, uh, for the process, investigating the bids and, and the subject matter, which is the towing contract. It has given detailed uh, responses to the protests, which I understand the city has in its, and the city council has in its file. There's nothing new there's nothing that will be added in the next two weeks to change where we are right now. We believe the city has adequate information to make its decision consistent with the city's manager's recommendation. Everybody who has seen this issue has recommended that the awards be made consistent with the uh, initial award recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um Jose de Jesus Rivera, you do have two minutes. City Councilman. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, I'll never say this to Paul Levine again because he stole all my notes. Uh, so I won't repeat everything he said. Uh, I, I do, do want to comment that the danger there is in post continuing to postpone this. Uh, the people that are going to be hurt are really the citizens of Phoenix because if you look at the new contract, we'd have to go in the old contract and the old contract is significantly higher than the bids that came up on the new contract. The more you delay, the more harm and the more loss that the citizens of Phoenix are suffering. Uh, there's also the consideration that this contract was supposed to go into effect on February 1st. My client and everybody else's client, although it's not a large consideration, have already started purchasing equipment 
because they were supposed to be going on on February 1st. The longer this gets to be continued, the more loss that there is on that. Um, I got a really flowery speech, but I think that you heard what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that testimony. There's one other card, and I think it was in favor of continuance, Mr. Jeffrey uh, Dunn. There are no other cards uh, on today's. So right now the motion on the floor is for a uh, continuance until March 7th, 2018. I believe the continuance is asked for by, I don't know who asked it. I made the motion, so. Okay, so the motion is to continue the uh, item. Um, obviously, it doesn't affect ultimately or in indicate any one of this council's position on the substantive issue. Normally, when a council member does ask for a continuance at a matter of professional courtesy, that is granted uh, for a reasonable period. Uh, and so um, that's the motion that is on the table. Any comments on a per continuance? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We'll see you back here on March 7th. Next item, Vice Mayor. I move approval for item 47. There's a motion. Is there a second on 47? Second. There's a motion a second. Mr. Leonard Clark, testimony on 47. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council, for letting me speak. My name is Leonard Clark, and while I, I approve of it, uh, you're going into an agreement with a developer with uh, the school district of Levine. Unfortunately, the premise of why you're doing it is because the Loop 202 South Mountain Freeway was extended into our indigenous brothers and sisters First Nations land of the Gila River community. I don't believe they were treated fairly, so the whole foundation of what you're doing, the developer will be able to apply for impact fees. I want the children to have a school. They were going to have a school before this monstrosity of a freeway was shoved down the throats of the Healy Indian River community and many of us who did not want any more air pollution. But that being said, I'm just concerned. Um, within this agreement, it says that the fenced in athletic fields will be available to the public because the city of Phoenix is going into this agreement with Parks and Recreation, our Parks and Recreation Department. But they're saying at the end of the day, it will be open to the public. But are these children not going to have baseball teams, soccer teams, all of these athletic activities? Where will they play if you also open the public? Because it's very competitive. My other concern is the land will be open to people that maybe the school officials will not be able to see coming on to the school property. So while it's a good idea at heart, what I'm worried about as well is not only that the children will not have their sports team facility because it's open to the public, who from the public will be coming onto the school land? How are you going to check them in this day and age of what's going on in our school systems? Thank you so much. I'm against. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clark. Ms. Erickson, I don't know if you'll come forward and answer those very good questions. Um, Kids are going to play on this uh, land or in the school day. What happens after hours? And by the way, I think it's a super exciting collaborative effort, exactly the model that we should be looking at, the city and school districts working together so that recreation opportunities are maximized. But Mr. Clark has raised some good questions. Uh, Mayor, member of the members of the council, indeed, uh, during the school day, the gates will be closed. The kids will be able to use the fields. At nighttime, when the school is closed, the gates will be opened and it will be able, able to be used for soccer or whatever other programs we have there, basketball, uh, those types of things. So in essence, what is happening is the school gets to use the facilities during the day, and at night, then the public would get to use them, and the Parks and Recreation uh, Department would program the activities. All right, uh, thank you very much. I'll now turn over to the members of the council and say that I will certainly be supportive of this item and actually think it is a great model that we can look not just for new schools that are being built with the growth in, in the community, there probably will be some more schools, but actually going into some of our established schools and seeing if we can use this as a model to crack the code, if you will, uh, to allow for school facilities to be better accessed by the community as a whole instead of overly worrying about liability issues, let's figure out a way to, to get to yes. So I'm, I'm excited that we are gonna have this model in place that we might be able to take elsewhere. Councilman Gallego. Thank you. So this is in uh, the city council district. I have the pleasure of representing, and I agree with Mayor Stanton, this is a great model of success. And thank you to Mr. Haggerty and, and the whole school board at, at, the, at the district as well. We've been working on this for quite a while. 
to get it right and I have talked regularly about the school safety issues and the importance of letting the public be able to use the fields when school wasn't in session but making sure that the students have priority while they are at school. Um, the mayor alluded to this, but we often get asked at the city, what can we do more for education? And community schools is one of the answers that we do have because we don't control school district budgets and school district funding. But we can step up and say, how do we partner? Can we, the city, pay for lights so that people can use the field and be at the school longer? The school doesn't have to pay for some of that. This is an exciting uh, program. It will be built to our city park standards, which means it'll be a high quality facility and really was a good example of a win, I think, for the school district, for the community that's coming in this area, as well as the city. We, I think, mostly would like to have a lot more parks than we do, and we want to be fiscally responsible, so this is a good way to leverage our tax dollars, and we've been working on this for now multiple years, a lot of time in coming, so I want to thank everyone who put the time into this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin Haggerty, thanks for coming down. Great to see you. It's great to be here. Single, just grab it in there. There we go. That still works. <laughs> anyway, Kevin Hagerty, I'm the executive director of business and operations for the Lean Elementary. We've been working with city staff on this, like uh, Representative said, a long time. It's been years, but it also shows that we're able to work through a lot of these machinations because there's a lot of barriers when you put something like this together that we were able to bust through all of those things and bring this to you today. So we're looking forward to approval of this and also looking at future projects. We we're already in discussion about other things we can do to leverage tax dollars. Good for our taxpayers, good for the citizens, and it's good for this area. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for working with us. Vice Mayor, you had a comment? I do have a comment. Um, who is going to maintain uh, Mayor Stanton and members of the um, council and Vice Mayor Pastor, the uh, school district would maintain um, the the uh, grounds. Um, it would be part of their, their their regular maintenance that they do as well, and they would have to maintain it to the standards that we we set and we agree upon. So okay. So so what is the cost to the city? Uh, the cost to the city is going to be the lights that we put on and the electricity. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions by members of the council? There's a motion in favor. There is a second. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that item passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is item number uh, 48. Mr. Manager, what is item 48? Uh, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, Ms. Erickson could explain it better, but really it is a, a contract with transportation media that uh, we will provide us with a payment, uh, $10,000 a year escalating, and provide us scorecards, tees, and benches. Is that and correct, benches Peter? and uh, the pencils, uh, things of that nature, ball washers. Um, and this is uh, an effort to then take the expense off of our side, but get us revenue as well. And they they put advertising on the cars, is that how they make That's their correct. revenue? Okay. Advertisement. So they will pay us $10,000 a year and then increasing uh, from the year 12, one 000, on. Yes, correct. Okay, is there a motion on item 48? Move no. item 48. There's a motion, there is a second. Any cards on 48? Any comments by members of our city council? I, just, I have Vice a Mayor, comment please, please. and I just want to get it, some clarity. So it's, it's generating revenue. That's correct. Okay. Just want that on the record. And eliminating an expense. It's eliminating an expense. It's generating revenue. Those are the items that we like. Thank you. Mayor, I'll just say since since we're talking about it, so this is a good thing. I don't think we should be in the golf business, but obviously this helps alleviate at least a little bit of the cost. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Mayor. Councilman Elkowski, please. And what's advertised on the vehicles will have our stand, it'd be city standards, right? Uh, the advertisement, we would have to approve any of the advertisement. All right, thank you. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, that passes unanimously. Next on the agenda is item 51. Is there a motion uh, on 51? Move approval. Approval for item 51. This is the development of 200 West Monroe Street. There's a motion. There is a second. Uh, 
Uh, there appears to be no opposition uh, here present. David Kreider is here. Are you in favor of the uh, matter? Thank you for registering your support. Dan Clocky from Downtown Phoenix, Inc., also in favor. Uh, Nick Wood, available to speak if requested, is representing the applicant, is my understanding, so obviously in favor. And then Noah Gottlieb, available to speak if requested. It's up to you whether you want to speak. All right, so the motion is in favor. There is a second. I'll now turn to members of the council. Any comments or questions on the item? Mayor, if Nick doesn't speak, does he get paid? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, Nick. <laughs> Anyways, all right. All right, that is actually attorney client privilege information, so we can't uh, discuss uh, that matter. All right, there motion in favor, second, roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Thank you, vote. Williams. Pastor. I have uh, one question. I just wanted to make sure when uh, we voted on this in the subcommittee that planning and development and a CED was going to be part of uh, this motion. I just want to make sure it's in there. Mayor, Vice Mayor, you are correct. Okay. Uh, Ellen Stevenson sitting next to me is included and has been working with the client uh, already. Okay, yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, the item passes on a seven to one vote before the city council. The next item on the agenda is item 52. Uh, this is Phoenix Convention Center, food and beverage. Is there a motion on 52? I move item uh, 52, Convention Center, food and beverage. Is there a second? There is a second. Any cards in this item? Councilman Gallego, do you have comments on 52? I do. Um, so 52 is the convention center contract, and I think the contract we just did at the airport is a good model for that, where we tried to bring in diverse local businesses. Um, so right now, as written, it gives some points for local business partnerships, but on this one in particular, I think a local supply chain is important. People who are visiting our city and our convention center want to be able to try unique food and beverage products that they can't get in their hometown, and so that having those options um, specifically is something that we ought to give points for. And then um, typically when we do these major changes in contracts, we have often had a few months of employee retention, usually that as it comes out of subcommittee, and I didn't see that in this one. So I wanted to ask uh, if we could have a friendly amendment to the motion where we would can include that standard location as well as a preference for local supply chain. And then um, we often allocate a few points for um, in the operations plan for equal pay. And so could we do that with a few points within operation plan given for equal pay? Mayor, Councilwoman uh, Gallego, um, in the, uh, although it's not detailed in the staff report before you, uh, in this actual solicitation with regard to, um, I'll, I'll, I'll recall some of the things that you had outlined, but with regard to employee retention, um, in the solicitation, the selected proposer will be contractually obligated uh, and required to offer employment opportunities to existing employees for a period of uh, 120 days uh, for in similar job classification. So this is actually consistent with the solicitation that was just recently uh, concluded uh, by the Aviation Department. Um, with respect to uh, equal pay, again, proposers will be contractually obligated uh, to follow the city's equal um, employment opportunity requirements uh, pertaining to equal compensation for performing uh, similar work. And then uh, with regard to local supply chain, again, there will be a requirement in the evaluation criteria for uh, proposers to demonstrate uh, commitment to source local products as part of the uh, contract and as well to uh, have minority and uh, local business participation in um, as part of the proposal. And so points will be allocated for equal pay and for local business supply chain? Not as line item points, but they're part of a criteria which includes business plan, operational plan, um, management, and qualifications. So they're, 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 they're specifically listed as part of the criteria, but there aren't specific points allocated to those items. They're part of a, a general point allocation. But if you didn't address them, you couldn't yeah. get a perfect score. Correct. Great, thank you. Vice Mayor. So could you please explain that to me again? Because uh, there are, are you saying there are certain criteria that they have to meet 
an order in the business plan area in order to get a business plan point. Correct, um, Vice Mayor. So one of the criteria is business plan, for example, and okay. part of that criteria is uh, asking proposers to um, tell us if they are including uh, local business participation as part of their proposer, proposal. So local businesses could participate as a, as a subcontractor to the primary proposer, and that is part of the evaluation criteria. So how do you know that the subcontractor sub is providing equal pay when it's a like third party? It, it would be a I mean, requirement of the primary uh, contractor, but those obligations would also flow to the subcontractor. So for example, in equal pay, it's not that you could say, I'm not gonna have equal pay and get less points. You have to give equal pay based on the city's ordinance. And that's the, the contractor is held to that standard during the life of the contract. So it's not an alternative, you have to do it. And, it, and you have to certify that you'll do it in your response. Is that correct, John? Correct. So who inspects that or enforces that? Okay. The convention center management and contract uh, manager is responsible to ensure that that happens. Okay. Any other comments or questions before this, uh, take a vote on this? All right, so it sounds like in light of the answers, there's not a request to amend it, that it generally is covered in the current, uh, in the current um, solicitation. All right. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Yeah. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. <laughs> yes. That item passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda are items 87 no. through, oh, 54. Item 54. I apologize. Move approval of item 54. I'm sorry, I apologize. Item 54 is the West Ground Transportation Center RFQ. Vice Mayor has made a motion in favor. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, are there any cards on item 54? Any comments by members of this council? Councilman Waring, please. So on 54, this is not, I'm not necessarily a fan of SkyTrain, but this is stuff around SkyTrain. So if you're gonna have SkyTrain, you might as well put good stuff around it, and so I'm supporting it, thank you. What's considered good stuff? <laughs> good stuff. We'll see how he votes just, when it comes yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. All curious. right, so the motion is in favor. There's a second. Any other comments? Yes. Councilman Gallego, please. Um, so this is looking at um, a new financing model for the airport. Typically, the airport has financed and built most of these uh, directly. And we, uh, through the airport, have been an important supporter of public art. So as we move forward with this new model, I guess I would like to see us say that we'll continue, even if the private sector is the one building it, that we continue to support. Uh, public art at the airport? Is that the 1%? I think the question really is, is the 1% for the arts program included in the proposed RFQ for whatever uh, building costs are associated with it? Yeah, that's what I'm just <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 1% for the arts? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Anything else? Oh, wonderful. Then, and then as we move forward with different parking models, I think it's important to have a diversity of owners. So if someone who owned a bunch of, um, we would just have diversity of people owning parking. There wouldn't be one entity that could own all of the parking around the airport. Uh, uh, Mayor, to, uh, to Councilwoman Gallego, this, this uh, proposal that is in front of you is for the on-airport parking only. And so the proposals would be limited to uh, our existing on airport business and and would not involve uh, those air uh, those parking facilities off the airport not controlled by the city right but we've had a conversation about well, there's several things happening with airport parking now and moving forward more privatization we would make sure that no one entity could own all the on airport parking and buy off the off airport parking uh, the, correct they would not uh, we would not uh, allow them to uh, acquire all of the off-airport parking facilities. Perfect, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions by members of council? Councilman Alkowski, please. Mayor, just for some clarification, we're not just talking about a parking garage. We're talking about a multifaceted uh, facility that provide, it might have a hotel, offices, um, vendors, and all that. So I think that's something that I want to put on the record that we had a heavy discussion about this in the subcommittee regarding the, um, the use of not just a parking garage, we talked about the future that more people are using um, other means of transportation besides just driving their own cars to the airport and making sure that the parking garage in the future needs to be changed into office space or retail space that it'll be easily flipped over to do that. And also to take in consideration the neighborhood um, surrounding this location and we have those public hearings and making sure it fits within the um, cultural um, atmosphere of that neighborhood. Talking about the Varios Unidos area, Sacred Heart area, that the community has some input and that they um, basically um, okay the project also somehow, some way. This is the good stuff. Thank you very much, Councilman Hokowski. Councilman Waring, any additional comments or questions? Thank you. I'm still supporting it despite your best efforts to dissuade me, um, a couple of you. But uh, so, so since it came up specifically, but you and I had already talked, the city is not going to build a hotel at the airport. Just anybody at home or anybody who might have seen me blanch at the very idea in my office, it's not going to happen, correct? Uh, Mayor, to uh, Councilman Waring, that is correct. Uh, we are looking for the private sector to actually pay us a some form of a land rental and then they would uh, invest and develop and own and operate and finance any improvements that are erected on that property. Thank you. And Jim, I'll be honest, I'm only only voting for this because you asked so nicely. A little inside joke between. <laughs> this is considered a, a P3, right? Or P4, or I don't know, what are you considering? Uh, Mayor, uh, uh, Mayor to uh, Vice Mayor Pastor, uh, we, we're actually viewing this as a, uh, very similar to the food and beverage and the retail contracts that you just uh, uh, approved. We're viewing this as a concession. And uh, it is a parking concession, but then also a development concession for uh, a level of services that we don't currently provide on the west side to the Phoenicians on the west side of the airport. So we view it as a concession. And it's fair to say this is very common in airports around the country, particularly on-site hotel uh, at the airport where you would obviously allow a, con a concession air, uh, hotel to come on right on site for the convenience of the traveling public. Uh, Mayor, that is correct. Other comments or questions? Vice Mayor? So the whole package is considered a concession? Like I can, uh, what I'm thinking is the parking is a concession and then all the other pieces are, are, are a little bit different than a concession. Because I think of a concession like a concession stand. So could you please explain that to the public? Yeah, and, and Mayor to uh, Vice Mayor Port Pastor, thank you for the question. That's a great, uh, that's a great question. So we, uh, once again, we view it very similar to uh, uh, what, what you just recently approved for Terminal 3 and that uh, we're, if we're going to, as Councilman Nowakowski has indicated, we're going to see if there's interest in a hotel concession. So we would, we provide the space, which is the land, but uh, whoever is successful in this activity would come in and they would finance, design, build the tenant improvements called the hotel on, on the uh, airport property. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Councilman Nowakowski, please. Mayor, responsible departments. I know that we talked about including the economic development department, seeing that they've done such a great job in attracting businesses and to the downtown area and hotels and all that. I don't see that in here. So I want to make sure that there's somehow, some way, I, think, I know that was something we talked about at the subcommittee, that we would include them as one of those responsible departments to making sure we get the best um, quality businesses and and if there is a hotel, hotel also. So do you want me to amend mm -hmm. the motion? If you or, can and, and add that in. Add, yeah, could you please include, uh, actually I'm gonna expand it, could you please include um, economic development and planning and, and zoning? 
Sure. Mayor Councilman Nolkowski, Vice Mayor Pastor, as we talked about in 70, yes, the economic, Community Economic Development Department will be part of this process uh, intimately, and um, we will make sure that happens along with planning and development. Thank you. All right, so it was a uh, friendly amendment. It was accepted. Does the second accept the uh, friendly amendment? Who was the second? Felder. Felder, okay. Any other comments or questions? Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. This Mayor, item. I didn't hear Jim's. Um, what was that? Yes. I said yes. I smiled at Jim. Did you say yes? Wow. That's a good thing. Let's celebrate. Woohoo! No, that's not true. <laughs> thank you for that clarification, Mayor. All right. Thank you. The vote was, in fact, unanimous before the City Council. All right, now we're on items 87 through 90. Uh, we have four citizen petitions for us to consider uh, here today. Uh, unless anyone objects, we're just gonna hear them in the, the order in which they're placed on the agenda. Um, item 87 is a consideration of a citizen petition that outlaws funding of city funds, buildings, and staffing resources, including policing for any future visits from President uh, Trump, um, I think we have cards on all of the proposed uh, citizen petitions. Council Williams, do you have a motion you'd like to put on the floor and see if there is a second and then we can take testimony based upon the motion? I have a motion. Uh, I say that uh, we reject this particular petition. It is not in the best interest of the city of Phoenix and all the residents of not only the city of Phoenix, but anyone who would uh, be attempted to be part of this, whether it's the arrival at the airport, traveling on our streets, dealing with police officers, or having a function. Uh, it is our duty and responsibility to make sure the safety of all the people, and uh, therefore I would uh, recommend denial. The motion is for denial. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. There are five cards on Citizen petition number 87. Uh, I'll go in order of uh, uh, cards, but a little bit kind of back and forth. We have cards both in favor and opposed. Mr. Carlos Garcia, you are in favor of the citizen petition. Please come forward and provide up to two minutes of testimony. The second speaker will be Mr. Tim Raffelty, I believe, uh, who is opposed uh, to the citizen petition. Mr. Garcia. Mayor, Council, as, as you all remember what happened last August, um, there's a, the following petition about the police misconduct that happened that day. <clears throat> yes, of course, and, and I read the city manager's proposal to, to deny this. Of course, this was for, forced upon you. Of course, the federal government bullied themselves in here and forced this city to spend three quarters of a million dollars. We just saw a homeless person come up here and explain her situation. Many of us who drive down the cast uh, center and, and see the folks that are out there and know the resources that the city's lacking to think that we spent three quarters of a million dollars for this person this this president to come spew hatred and bigotry to come spit in our face and pardon the sheriff who was convicted um, we paid for a campaign rally the city paid for a campaign rally you have an opportunity um, to do this and stand up for not only Phoenix, but cities across the country to not welcome the, this bullying, this hatred that's coming into our cities to divide us, to create the chaos that it did on that day. Um, I ho hope that you all can make this vote and vote the right way. Um, I know many of you are gonna be shifting in the next couple of months, um, and I hope that the council as it stands can take and make this decision together and deny this president the ability to come and bully and rob this city of three quarter of a million dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, testimony. All right, next, uh, there were a series of cards of individuals who wanted to speak on both 87 and 88, so I apologize, so we'll get to those speakers as well. I'll take comments on both, but the next speaker will be Tim and then Mr. Leonard Clark. Tim. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'm saddened that we have to spend our time on this subject, but seeing how we're here, I believe that I speak for the majority of citizens is that they agree with the staffs 
recommendation of denying this. And I agree with that too. And again, I apologize that the city has to sit here and listen to this. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Le uh, Leonard Clark is next, and then the following Mr. Clark will be Jim Williams. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. The uh, current occupant, when he's not at Mar-a-Lago, when he's at the White House, he's a billionaire. As uh, our brothers and sisters have testified, we have many homeless in Phoenix now. You know, you've made it against the law for them to get blankets, to be fed, denying basic precepts if you're a Christian, a Muslim, whatever, or just a good human being. So I would ask you to change your minds. Uh, this, this individual in the White House, you know, threatens cities all the time, sanctuary cities, all of these things, the threats he's gonna do to us, sue us. Stop being afraid of this demagogue and send a strong message that, that we will we will ask that you condemn this American Putin. Thank you. I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clark. Jim Williams is next, and then followed by Rich Osiol. Mr. Williams. Uh, my name is Jim Williams, and I thank you for letting me come up and speak. And I'm uh, also ashamed that we even have to speak to something like this because our president was elected by the majority of the people in this country. He, he, was our, he is our elected president, and you guys are our elected representatives, city councilmen, and everything else. If he can't have any police protection, why should any of you have it? If a group can get together and bully and try to push mob rule down our throats to do away with protections afforded to people, then we have anarchy. We, we live in a nation that uh, is governed by laws by the Constitution. We have a president, and it's our, our duty and our responsibility, I think, to protect anybody that comes into this city. So, thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Williams. Obviously, the president was not elected by a majority of the people. It was a different system under which he was elected uh, president of the United States. I'm Rich Rich Osio. Rich Osiol is the uh, next uh, next speaker. I didn't mean to make political commentary. I just mean factually, it's factually accurate that it was not a majority of the citizens. It was. Uh, Rich Osiol is next, and then the follow is uh, followed by Adam Roca. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. A couple of people have um, also said, kind of like, why are we even discussing something like this? Everybody has the right to come to Phoenix, like them or not. At should, let me rephrase that, all legal citizens yeah. and people who have legal papers have a right to come to Phoenix and should be protected by the police. 55 years ago, through no fault of their own, the president was killed in Dallas. It is still a black eye for that city. And we don't want anything like that to put a black eye on our city. And uh, just to tie this very briefly into the very next uh, item on the agenda, I've been part of tons of protests in my Wait, life. You're on 88 now? Pardon me? You'll have a chance to come up and talk, speak, we'll do 88 separately. Oh, okay. 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 Anything else on 87? Uh, no, I would just say uh, I'm glad that the staff has recommended against this proposal, and I appreciate the comments that Ms. Williams made on introducing it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Bill Wood. Okay, no problem. Who, who would like to go next then? What do you want? Adam Rocha. Please, come forward. And then, is that Mr. Wood in the back? Yeah. So maybe someone can bring a, a microphone to him to make it easier for you next. Mr. Rocha, Rocha please. Yes, Mayor. Uh, my name is Adam Rocha, and I'm a retired uh, first sergeant uh, from in, in the Army. And, uh, you know, I cannot understand why we are talking about this because we're talking about protecting our president and uh, and they just because people don't like him i didn't i didn't like uh president obama but but i but i took him for eight years and i didn't go demonstrating against him i never said don't protect him or anything and uh these guys that uh that uh, talk about not protecting him and he's not my president 
he is your president. He's your president too, Mayor. And uh, and uh, he, <laughs> you know, I don't understand. I don't understand why you would even talk about this because because he is our president and he's welcome in Phoenix always, you know, just like everybody else's. I thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Mm -hmm. The question has come up, why are we here? The, the reason is under our city charter, citizens have a right under citizen petitions to ask for policy decisions to be made. And under our charter, we will hear those items. And that's why we're here. It's because our city charter dictates that when a petition is made, we'll hear those items. Miss Antone, Lisa Antone, followed by Karen Woods. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Wood, you're next. I apologize. Does he have a microphone at this point? Oh, please, great. Oh, wait, no, I apologize. Mr. Wood was next. I jumped ahead. It was my fault. You'll be next. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. okay. I, uh, I just agree with uh, what the uh, fellow speakers have said about us protecting anybody that comes to this city. Uh, if Obama came to the city, they would have had and they had protection for him. Anybody of that caliber as a president should be protected, whether you like him or you don't like him. As it was said, it would be a black eye on this city if something did happen to the president of the United States while he was here. So I'm requesting that the, the council reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Antone, you're next, and then followed by Karen Woods. Hi, my name is Lisa Anton. First, Mayor Stanton, I think that your, your comment was incredibly inappropriate as the mayor of Phoenix. He is our duly elected president under the Electoral College, which is how the United States elects presidents, and I know you're well aware of that. Your comment was rude. Um, Trump is our president, and if they want to sit, if somebody wants to come out from this particular group and talk about hate, let me tell you about the hate that is witnessed from the group that has made this proposal. Monday, they had a 25 or 30 foot blow up of President Trump in a KKK outfit at a homeless park throwing their chlakas at him. Okay, so you want to talk about hate. And they're proud. They're proud of their hate. They call anybody, anybody who stands against illegals, white supremacists. They call it to my face. They call it to anybody's face. Illegal aliens is the correct term. I stand against illegal immigration as a matter of law. It is a matter of law. It is not about the person. It is about the law. They spew more hate and lawlessness than almost any group I've seen. They stand on the side of the road with their 30-foot President Trump. They, they have the F Trump shirts. They are so proud of hating this country and hating what this country is about and resisting this president and refusing to acknowledge. And the fact that, that this is even brought up is deplorable and disgusting. Honestly, it's shameful that there is a group of citizens who promote illegal aliens being allowed to come in here and say that our president, our elected president, whether or not any of you like him, I don't care. He is my president. And to say that is disgusting and wrong. Pelosi was here yesterday. How come we aren't having that conversation? They didn't seem to have a problem when Leader Pelosi was here yesterday and police resources were used. If you don't act like lawless criminals, we don't have to spend three quarters of a million dollars protecting the president. If you come out to peaceably right, assemble, thank you very much, Ms. peaceably assemble. You're right. You're right. Time. Thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate it. I appreciate your testimony. I didn't. I didn't actually. I didn't mean to be rude at all. The, the gentleman had made a misstatement uh, that. Uh, President Trump received the majority of the votes. That was simply inaccurate. I wanted to point that out. He did win the Electoral College, no doubt about it. But in terms of the uh, voter uh, results, uh, he lost by more than 3 million votes. All right, Karen Woods is next, and then followed by Jennifer Harrison. Hello. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Karen Wood, and I am an American veteran. I am also a former police officer. I would like to tell you that what I find most disturbing about this entire process is that we have, as a, as a nation, gotten away from respect for authority, respect for our police officers, respect for our president, 
respect for our processes, respect for our laws, and I find it very, very disheartening. I find it disheartening that we have people who laugh and think it's funny when they get away with breaking the law. They, they, they think it's comical. That's not what I serve my nation for. That's not what I served as a, as a, a military person. That's not what I serve for as a police officer, to protect and maintain order. Because I love this country. And these officers out here every day go out there and risk their lives for a bunch of people who laugh at them and have contempt for our own laws. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Vidi Hernandez, Vidi here, do you want to provide testimony next on 87 and then followed by Jennifer Harrison? Hello, Council, uh, Mayor and Council, thank you for bringing this item up. Um, well, I, uh, that was my petition, and so I support the petition and I am opposing the recommendation from the city. There continues to be a comment that says that it is the city's responsibility um, to provide the security. I would like to know where that is written, where that mandate is, and what, are, what is that that we're following on that responsibility. The other thing that was mentioned on that petition is that the cost is the issue, right? The cost and the, there's two different things. One of them being the cost that over a quarter million dollars was spent on those few hours when there is constantly conversations about there not being enough money to do the things that citizens want um, and the citizens need, like you heard earlier today. And so this vote, we ask that it's an immediate vote, especially as there are elections coming up and as people are gonna be running for different offices, that this is something that is on the responsibility of the current council, especially right now as we embark in a new budget process. And as the budget process begins and we are gonna continue to deny services for community members and refusal to spend money on community, yet we we're saying that we're okay spending this money. Trump's visit was not only a financial burden for our city, but it was also a safety concern. And for us, if you're, it's not about making a, fiscal responsible, a fiscally responsible decision, then we are asking for a community safety decision. In denying this visit, that enlisted hate, that people were hurt, um, that protesters were, peaceful protesters were extremely hurt and taken to the hospital. So, and that if there's gonna be money spent, that that money should be spent on training the police department to ber better and professionally and safely treat the Phoenix community, especially the peaceful protesters that were there that day. So we ask that this is an urgent vote, that this money is not used, and if this, there is gonna be money used, that you bill the federal government and not take it from the city's tax, from our taxpayer money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Ms. Harrison. Ms. Harrison, you're next, thank you. Hi, okay, so I think the key takeaway here is citizen, U.S. citizen, so taken directly, taken directly from the Puente's um, Facebook page, chained protesters shut down the streets for the Trump rally. MCSO says people have been arrested, two cars are towed, protesters blocked part of Shea Road. So that sweet moment when you and your team shut down Main Street to the Trump rally, traffic gets rerouted, that protesters make tactical choice to form blockade on Main Road to Trump rally, effectively not allowing Trump supporters to the rally. In what world do we live in? Do we legal aliens take over our city and demand that our elected president not be able to visit when they themselves are lying in the roads, chaining themselves to streets, blocking traffic, uh, interfering with citizens' right, citizens' rights to attend any event in this city that they want. Nobody has a right to stand in my way and not let me go and see my president. I thank you very much, uh, Ms. Harrison. I have no other cards on item 87. So there is a motion to Deny. There is a second. I'll now hand it over to any members of the council who would like to provide testimony 87. Councilman Nowakowski, please. You know, Mayor, we were just hearing about the expense. Was this a, a presidential visit or was it a rally for his campaign? I'm kind of confused about that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Council Member Nowakowski, 
Um, we're considering this to be a mutual aid agreement between us and the federal government to provide protection and assistance with that. It's in our mutual aid policy, Ops Orders 1.4, that we do that. And then, Chief, is there, uh, is there any reimbursement that we get as a city on this? or? So, Mr. Mayor, members of council, council member Nowakowski, no, there is no reimbursement. It's just a component and function of us protecting our community members as well as those who come in to visit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments by members of this um, uh, of this council? Can I ask, Vice when Mayor, you please. follow that order, is that uh, because he's in coming to visit on a official uh, meeting or official standard, or is it coming for a campaign? So, Mr. So is it regardless Mayor, members of campaign of council, or official visit, you provide uh, protection? So, this was a visit that he came, he rented out the convention center. Anytime a sitting president comes to our valley and or any other city in the country, by mutual aid agreements, we are required to help and assist in that protection. So whether whether or not it's a, it's a pre-visit, a campaign visit, he is a sitting president along with cabinet members. It's our responsibility to provide that protection. Yeah, thank you. Is there any other uh, comments by members of this uh, uh, council? All right, um, I'll be supporting the motion. Look, the reality is, is that it's our obligation, regardless of who uh, a dignitary visiting President of the United States or any other dignitary needing protection when the, when the police make a determination that there is a safety concern, uh, regardless how you feel about that person. I spoke out strongly about how I felt about this particular president and many of his uh, uh, policies, but when it comes to public safety, we have an obligation to provide uh, uh, public safety services to any dignitary uh, visiting our uh, community. It's the responsibility of the city of Phoenix. We don't pick and choose whether we happen to like the policies of that person or not. It's an obligation of the uh, of the city. So I'll be supporting the uh, motion. Mayor. Councilman Kowski, please. I'll be supporting the motion, but I'd like to look into the future. If, if somebody's coming to campaign on our dime, I don't think it's right. I think we need to reimburse the, um, the campaign or so. I, if any of my colleagues up here uh, we're not allowed to use city resources to to campaign for ourselves. So I believe that there needs to be something maybe we need to look at the federal level or at the city level where we need to get reimbursed for that. I'm talking not on behalf, on any president. I don't care if it's a Democrat, if it's a Republican or an independent president. If they're here for a campaign reason, now if they're here as an official visit as the president of the United States, I think we need to give them everything that we have to make sure that our, our president's protected, right? But I think if it's for a rally, a campaign, or any elections, I think we as a, as a body here need to figure out some type of policy in the future um, to, to, to deny these kind of things or not to put a th three quarter of a million dollars that's not budgeted. I'm not sure where it's coming out of, if it's coming out of the police budget comes out of general funds, but as the um, chair of public safety, every month we actually go over our budgets for police, fire, and our court system, and we've been balancing that budget very, uh, every, every, every month it comes zero budget. So it's kind of hard to have a zero budget when you have surprise visits, especially when it's a rally, and, how, and during election time, how many times would a president candidate actually come to the um, city of Phoenix and does other cities pick up that cost if he happens to fly into Sky Harbor and goes to Tempe do we escort him to the border of Tempe or how does that work so Chief Mr. Williams. I'm sorry Mr. Mayor members of council council member Nowakowski um, it's just again back to our mutual aid agreement that every city has to provide resources in order for that transport and protection um, again, other cities around the country are faced with a similar situation and circumstance. Um, it's my understanding that the president's campaign did pay for the use of the convention center, but to the point of our overtime costs and costs related to the protection piece, there is typically no reimbursement. I'd just like to see if we can explore that in the future for all presidents, not just talking about the present, but in the future. Mayor. Council Williams, please. Uh, with all due respect to the councilman, I'm 
I think, uh, a definition of campaign, because if you have a sitting president, senator, a dignitary from another uh, state that comes into our city, um, come on, we're all politicians. We campaign all the time, whether it's that's the defined purpose of the trip or not. Uh, that's what it's about, and I want to be very cautious that we don't err on the side of trying to be politically correct, when in fact uh, we could put people in danger, not only the person arriving and being part, uh, or the headliner of whatever it may be, uh, but also the citizens that are there to, to engage, to get an autograph, to see them. Uh, support them or not support them. I think we have to be very, very careful. This is a standard practice. It has been in fact probably since the first president, and it is part of our responsibility, and I believe the chief prepares her budget knowing that it could happen and that uh, she's able to prepare and cover the cost. So I want to be very careful and very cautious on how we would proceed with anything like that. All right, so the motion is to deny the petition. There is a second. Any additional comments by members of this council? Roll call. Diego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes, so the motion passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item number 88. <laughs> item number 88 is a consideration of citizen petition to outlaw Phoenix Police Department officers from using non-lethal chemical weapons at protests and large uh, community events. I have numerous cards on item uh, 88, and I just got some more. Uh, so we'll have a, a series, a, a large number of speakers on that uh, item. Uh, Councilman Williams, you want to put a motion on the floor, see if there's a second, and then we'll take testimony based upon that motion. Uh, I make the motion to deny the petition thereby preserving the use of chemical agents as non-lethal effective crowd management tools for Phoenix, Phoenix Police Department to maintain public safety and order. I will tell you, I am so proud of the police department. They did an outstanding job. I trust their judgment. They know what they're doing. And they have been recognized nationally and internationally uh, for their superb service to this community and the efforts that they have lived. So thank you very much for what you've done. Are there a motion? Is there a second? Second. There is a second. I, and I promised the chief earlier, and I apologize, uh, that I'll give the chief a chance to kind of explain what the current policy um, uh, is and provide some uh, important context for this council and the community. Chief Williams. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, and I'll try to keep it brief. So we use the tools that we utilize to create distance to keep the law enforcement officers from having to go hands-on with our community members. Uh, it's a proven tactic that's been used across the country, and in this instance, we use the same tool for that effort. If we do not have this tool available to us for our use, then officers have to go to other techniques in order to engage the crowd and to prevent unlawful activity. Those type of tools are batons, they could be stun guns, and sometimes it could be the use of canines, and that is not sound policing. So we do believe that these non-lethal tools are an option. Not every law enforcement officer whom you see wearing a blue uniform today has these tools to use. As a matter of fact, if one is on the line or part of the tactical response unit, he or she has to go through an annual certification process they have either a two-day two process to go through to be certified or a three-day. If they are part of the, the individuals who use the chemical tools, they go through a three-day certification process. And so we do use this tool judiciously. In the last 10 years, the tool has been utilized three times. So in 2010, during the National Socialist Movement, we used the tool. During 2016, um, I'm certain most of you remember when the freeway takeover a uh, crowd was going to take over the freeway, this tool was used, and obviously on August 22nd, the tool was used as well. I um, wanna give you just a little bit of dynamics to look at. In the city of Berkeley, they were not allowed to utilize this tool, and in the process, you have officers going hands-on with children, with students, with batons, and other weapons. Conversely, if you think about Charlottesville, 
Charlottesville told their employees to stand back and just allow violence to happen and erupt in the community, and we all understand and know uh, what happened there or three lives lost there. We do not take this lightly by any stretch of the imagination, so much so that after the Trump rally, uh, we made some revisions to our training. Uh, we've realized the need and the importance for there to be more audio sound available to our officers, so we purchased a different mask system that allows for more vocal um, direction and orders to be given for the officers and to the officers. And both of these methods are covered under our operations orders in two different sections. So thank you for the opportunity to provide a little bit of understanding on what and why we do what we do. And uh, just in closing, uh, our officers are going through the certification process as we speak today. They've been training for the last two days here in the city for those officers who are tactical response unit officers. I think, Chief, did you say, was it mask orders? I apologize. Uh... So yes, so the, the gas masks that the officers wear, we purchased a different system so that they will be, be able to be audi audible um, when they give instructions and directions as opposed to people not being able to hear that. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, I'll turn to members of the council for questions for uh, Chief Williams, who provided important context on uh, uh, the use of tear gas and other uh, techniques and tools. Any questions for for Chief Councilman Nowakowski, please? Mayor, within the last, I mean, Chief, within the last 10 years, how many times have we used gas on protests or a massive crowd? So it's been three th three times in 10 years. So 2010, 2016, and last year in 2017. Thank you. Any other questions for Chief Williams at this time? Okay, now I'll turn to members of the public who wanted to provide uh, testimony again. The motion by Council Williams is to deny the citizen uh, petition. Uh, let's see, I will start with, uh, how about Michelle Shaw? Did you provide testimony on this item? Ms. Shaw? Not here right now. And it's unfortunate because it says in favor, but it's before the motion's on the table. We, we gotta fix these cards someday, so it's on. So I'm, I actually, I don't wanna put on the record what position she is because it just, it would be unclear at that time. How about Maria Castro, Ms. Castro? And then how about, um, I guess we'll go in reverse order because a lot of people did 87 and 88, so I'll take 88 separate. Ms. Harrison will go next on 88. I have some images to provide for the council. Please, would our city clerk please grab the, those items? Thank you. My name is Maria Castro. Um, a couple of days before the president uh, came into the city of Phoenix, I met with uh, Phoenix police liaisons as well as uh, the Phoenix uh, DPS. And we were very explicit about us being nonviolent protesters, just wanting to exercise our First Amendment right of peacefully protesting. They all had my number, all four officers had my number. We told them, when it's time to disperse, please give us a call. We will tell our crowds to disperse. But unfortunately, the Phoenix Police Department violated our rights to peacefully protest and did not provide a warning until 20 minutes after. I myself was six months pregnant at the time and decided not to be in the front lines of the protest, but rather provide aid for folks in the city, uh, city uh, scape, is that what it's called? City civic space um, park. And it wasn't until after I had aided over four dozen people who had been doused in tear gas and pepper spray and had wounds from the from the the gun with the the rubber bullets that afterwards received a warning via helicopter telling the crowd to disperse. This is not a proper warning, and our rights were violated. Our rights were violated. Field Force Officer Benjamin Moore, number 6803, and Sergeant Douglas McBride, number 6187, Grenade Team Launcher, gave orders to tactical police to deploy a total of 525 rounds of pepper balls onto protesters without ordering police to give a notice of dispersal. Field Force Officer Benjamin Moore, number 6803, and Sergeant Douglas McBride, number 6187, should, have held, should be held accountable for their carelessness and poor leadership in ordering the deployment of excess chemical weapons to control uh, a group of 14 people that they, uh, they themselves mentioned that they were trying to control. Uh, also, John uh, Officer 
John Stewart number 8314 self deployed 2A140 uh, certified grenade one smoke cans onto protesters without approval from superior staff. We demand that the Phoenix Police Department suspend Officer Stewart and remove him from his tactical team. Uh, in addition to that, Phoenix police officers did not give warning um, in ref and also referred to these non-lethal chemical weapons as toys. And in the case of uh, Officer John Stewart deployed weapons at protesters without permission, the Phoenix Police Department failed to reprimand these officers um, for not following their own protocol. So obviously there was no control on behalf of Chief Williams, and so she was either incompetent and did not have control over her police force or was compliant with the abuse of Thank force. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich Hesswin. All right, next speaker will be Sandra the Solis, Sandra Solis. Would like to be able to speak for five minutes as well. All right, how about day and then the th following, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, I said earlier yes. Ms. Harrison would speak. I apologize. So Ms. Harrison is next and then Ms. Solis. I apologize. So again, I did read you quotes from this particular organization's Facebook page stating that their intentions were to block traffic and impede citizens from attending this rally where they were arrested. Why were they not all arrested? They should have all been arrested. This is unacceptable in this city. We have city laws, we have state laws, we have laws here in Arizona and America you do not get to make your own laws, okay? Chief Williams said that she's used chemicals three times, three times, all of which were left-leaning organizations causing disrupt disruptances in our city, okay? I am a political activist. I've been to hundreds of rallies, and I've never been hit with a pepper ball. I've never had tear gas expelled at me because I follow the law. I respect our, I respect our police department. When our police officers give instruction to go home, to leave, I don't linger around demanding that I can make up my own laws and I can do what I wanna do. It doesn't work that way here in the city of Phoenix. It doesn't work that way in the state of Arizona. It doesn't work that way here in America, okay? We have laws and we follow our laws. We respect our police department and we go home when they say to go home. If you don't wanna be sprayed with tear gas, follow the law. I think Ms. Harrison. Ms. Solis, did you have testimony? Good to see you. Hi, everybody. So my name is Sandra Castro Solis, and on the night of August 22nd, I actually led the legal observing efforts, which means we were neutrally grounded at the protest and there to observe what was going on. Um, contrast to the police record after action report that, was, that wasn't released until six months after August 22nd, um, we have a bunch of information that doesn't make sense. Um, the first is, the first chemical weapon was released at 7.33 p.m., unlike what the report says that the first uh, chemical weapon was deployed at 8.34 p.m. This is one minute after Donald Trump finished his speech. So Phoenix Police Department failed to give warnings. We have this from 50 different legal observers. There was no warning given. There was warning given about the throwing waters and the throwing rocks. Speakers were on the floor. However, no warning was given until 8.50 p.m., a whole 30 minutes after chemical weapons were deployed. And as Maria Castro mentioned, uh, 525 pepper balls and 4.75 liters of pepper spray were used to try to control 14 individuals who Chief Williams says they were going after. If they were going after Antifa, there was no reason why thousands of protesters should have been pepper sprayed, including myself. And if you wanna know what it feels like, I invite you to the next protest where PPD is active because you know what? They've done this before, they will do it again. It doesn't have to, Chief Williams doesn't have to say it's the third time, she will do it the fourth, fifth, sixth time, and won't reprimand her officers, including Benjamin Moore and Sergeant McBride, who gave the orders. I demand that the, the city council actually hold the police department accountable and reprimand these officers who went rogue that night and learn to, if it's, two, if it's a two-day training, maybe it needs to be a two-week training. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Solis. 
Mr. Eiler, James Eiler. Mr. Eiler, did you provide testimony? Is he here, Mr. Eiler? All right, how about uh, Leonard Clark? Did you want to provide testimony on this item? Please. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. I believe because of the fact I've attended your veterans subcommittee public safety meetings where public officials have made it no very knowledgeable to everybody in the public that many of the Homeland Security Division, State Homeland Division Department is staffed by Phoenix PD, probably some full-time officers, and then we have this breaking down between the federal government and the state government, these lines that were put there by our forefathers and foremothers, Ninth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, I hate to be st stating state rights here, they panicked, you know. They panicked, they were working closely with uh, the occupant in the White House uh, Secret Service. The, uh, they, they were told how high to jump and they jumped. I was there at the protest, ministers, elderly men, women, and children, for you took months and months, you would not even come out and rebuke what happened. And I don't even condemn all police, but you make them all look bad when you do that because you know, when you fire indiscriminately, even when I was in the United States Army, we were warned, you know, you violate the Geneva Convention and they catch you, you know, that's, you're going to jail. That's a, that's a war crime, you know, especially when all this was going on with Bosnia and Serbia and things that go on around the world today. But at first, you know, they came on the media, they said plastic bullets, foam projectiles weren't used, but thanks to a reporter who went out, found the shells. So when you say uh, chemical weapons should be used, the problem is we have an out of control police force because the union runs you, you're running for mayor, two of you on this council, one of you is running for Congress, you need their backing because you are more worried about being, being called anti-law enforcement than being called pro-constitution and pro-civil rights. I was there, ministers, men, women, and children, elderly people, tear gas. This is what they do in Iraq. This is what Putin does in Russia. Oh wait, I forgot the American Putin. You used drones that night and now you finally announced that you're using drones because you have your secrecy agreements with the Homeland Security Division in contravention of our civil rights. We are not the enemy, we are the American people and I would do the same thing for any right-wing extremists who love Trump. If you went out and you fired into them with plastic bullets, flashbang grenades, this is military. We have no posse comitatus anymore in this post 9-11 world. The Constitution is just a piece of paper to you. We are all the enemy. Now an out of control police force, you need a civilian oversight investigatory body like most major metropolitan cities in this country. We are one of the last. You have not sent one peep. Mayor Stanton, you said they will look in the mirror and I'm sure they'll do a good job. No, you are the captains of the ship of Phoenix. And I'm gonna hold you, the politicians, right. responsible. I will not blame the police. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Appreciate your testimony. How about uh, Tim Raff Tim Raffney again? And we'll follow that by uh, Ms. Vidi Hernandez. Good to see Mayor you. Mayor and City uh, Council members, um, I ag again agree with the City staff recommendation to deny this uh, particular petition. All professions whether it's this police department or that de police department, everybody has their problems. And I think everybody in this room would agree that if there were issues that the police department can improve upon, they need to improve upon there. It's called constant improvement. But this petition isn't about that. This petition is about this group that the city council and mayor know who they are that this group is telling the police department how to do their job. And again, I, I uh, appreciate the staff using common sense in, in, in uh, uh, asking you folks to deny this. And one other thing I would like to mention is, and it's on both sides here, uh, Where's the decorum in your city council meetings? Um, can you not make a rule that we can't have this disruption? And I agree, it's a disruption on both sides, but this is, this is not right. Could you all might want to take a look at improving your council members and eliminate this clapping and this talking over each other. This is unacceptable to, again, 
That's what I'm talking about. Is it, uh, uh, but anyway, you might take a look at that from, from an outsider. That, that might help your, your council meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vidi Hernandez is uh, next, followed by Vince Ansel. Oh, Mr. Yes. Council Warren, do you have a question or comment? Uh, just for the chief. So was there any loss of life at the event in August? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, council member Waring, no. Property damage? Not that I'm aware of any significance. Not so it would be so minor you're not even aware it happened no, sir. after a six-month report and so forth. Uh, how about uh, permanent or disfiguring injuries? Uh, that, not that I'm aware of, sir. Okay. That sounds like success to me. Um, <clears throat> combustible mix of people. Uh, yeah, obviously a lot of heat, a lot of people, a lot of differing views. No deaths? No, no sir. No permanent or disfiguring injuries? No property damage. No, sir. Probably aren't a lot of cities that can claim that in a rally of that size with the combustible mix that I just described. Certainly, I think the Iraq and Russia examples might be slightly overstated, but hey, it's a free country. Say what you want, I guess. I will say, to Mr. Rafferty's point, the shouting out, if you think you're proving how smart you are or how clever you are, that's what children do, okay? That's what kids do. You get kicked out of a second grade class. A second grade class, not high school, not college, a second grade class. So I don't really understand it. I'm not sure what point was being made over here. The guy's saying, you know, you might want to tone that down. He was pretty respectful, pretty polite. And then somebody just chooses to shout out. That's what children do. And they get chastised. And we hope when they grow up, they don't act like that anymore. So to the extent it's on both sides, on both sides, but it is appalling. It's hard to sort of watch. To be honest with you, we do have rules about this, but kind of blow right by them. It's becoming more and more frequent. I guess I just sort of accept the environment in which I live. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I will say this. I try not to act like I'm five when I'm out in public. I try, but I don't always succeed. But, but I don't understand that, and you're embarrassing yourselves and if you think you're making your point to a larger audience that, wow, we're really all that, you're not embarrassing yourselves. So I guess I will say this. In closing, just to reiterate, no deaths, no property damage, no disfiguring permanent injuries with thousands of people out in the heat. Now, whatever brain surgeon came up with the last item that we're not going to protect presidents, okay, I guess that would work both ways. But if the Secret Service said, well, we just can't do it, but he's still planning to come, what then? I think we'd have deaths, permanent injuries, and a lot of property damage. So that wasn't a particularly well thought out motion, not that all of the ones that we do are either. Just something to think about. I figure I'm gonna sit here and listen to this. I might as well get that off my chest. But I, I don't understand what anybody thinks. Thank you. Thank you for proving the point. Once again, keep shouting out. That's fantastic. We have a microphone right here. You can sign up. You can come up and talk. But instead, that's what children do. Okay. That's the way you want to roll. That's the way you want to roll. Go ahead and keep doing it. You're, you're proving my point exactly. Thank you. All right. Um, BD, BD, uh, BD Hernandez. Yeah, I mean, to reiterate that that's a perfect example of how criminalization is happening in our city and, and the leadership that's doing that. But there's a few things that I want to talk about about that day. The lack of accountability, the lack of transparency, and the culture of violence that this police department has had for several years. On the clarification that the police department did, I believe it was Milton Dahoney, um, is who's listed here, it says that the 1993 Chemical Weapon Convention applies only during warfare and does not apply to law enforcement in the U.S. If this is being outlawed in war, then why the heck are we using it on residents? Why the heck are we using it in the U.S.? So that's one of the first points. Then, talking about the, another clarification here that, was, that I need to make is that there were not only 10 complaints, and the city needs to figure out what y'all are gonna do around, there was a city council meeting where there was over six hours of complaints, and you're saying that there's only 10 complaints. That is not true, that is not accurate, plus the hundreds of complaints that were made on the city's pages, on, the, you know, on social media, and through the different organizations. So if you're gonna tell residents that their voice when they come speak 
doesn't matter, y'all need to be clear about that and let them know that you are not gonna count their complaints because there was not only 10 complaints. And then I wanna read um, one statement of someone's experience that day. So it says, my entire face, hands and lungs started burning and my eyes started watering. I turned to sprint back towards the convention center doors and injured my left foot heel during that attempt to get away. However, I temporarily lost my sight, was disoriented and had to feel my way back to the doors. I started coughing as I entered the doors and while inside I vomited a milky white substance onto the carpet. I still could not inhale and exhale with ease. I remained inside of the convention center to be dis decontaminated, decontaminated by the Phoenix Fire Department. On August 23rd, 2017, at approximately 12.50 hours, I went to the Abrazo, Arizona Heart Hospital emergency room at nine in the address. They quickly checked me and I was seen by Dr. Um, Bruce Tech. He completed a review and requested a chest x-ray to my lungs. This was a police officer's statement um, in the, one of the police officer and one of the reports that was given back. So when we say people were not hurt, that is a lie. When we said there was include injury, that was a lie. And to say that these are non-lethal is also a lie. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. <laughs> Vince Anzel, please. Vince Anzel is next. And then after Vince Anzel will be Mr. Uh, how about Jim Williams. <clears throat> The citizen petition process is being abused, and this is one of those cases, okay? I'm sure that when the citizen petition um, laws were put into place, that there were good intentions. However, there's got to be, I mean, the fifth largest city uh, in, uh, in the union uh, has the legal resources to be able to vet frivolous citizen petitions. And if these last two petitions aren't the very definition of frivolous, uh, then, <laughs> then I don't know what. But anyway, this is a waste of city resources and taxpayer monies when a petition is introduced whose goal it is to undermine and neuter law enforcement and to deny access to city services from a sitting president. I mean, how frivolous and how outrageous is that? Uh, let's not allow Phoenix to go the way of Baltimore, New York, Chicago, and Detroit, where chaos and mayhem seem to prevail while police are instructed to stand down in the face of violence. That's where this whole process is going to. And as far as tear gas goes, everybody crying about tear gas and everything. If you're a U.S. military member, you know that they throw you into the room, lock the door, throw tear gas in there, so you become accustomed to it, okay? We cannot afford to bring a third world banana republic ideology into a modern and thriving American city. Thanks to the staff for denying this petition. We hope that the city council votes in a like manner. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ansel. I appreciate it very much. Uh, this is uh, the citizen petition process is spelled out in our city charter, which are, is our city constitution. And we have an obligation when a citizen brings a petition to hear that petition. As long as I've been mayor, we have followed our city charter to a T. And whether I like an idea, not like an idea, think it's good public policy, not good public policy, we follow our city constitution, which is our city charter, and we are legally obligated to do so. And it's the right thing to do, and we're going to continue to do it. But I appreciate the point. To to whatever is written up as far as those citizens. That would have to go to a vote of the people of Phoenix to change that. Right now under our okay. city constitution, we're going to hear citizen petitions. Mr. Williams? And then followed by um, Manny Saldana, Manuel San Saldana. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, denying this petition too. Uh, I've, I've been in Phoenix for a long time. I've been to a lot of rallies, a lot of protests, uh, whether it was uh, Sheriff Joe or whether it's Phoenix PD, whether it's Donald Trump, it doesn't make any difference. I've been around to a lot of these uh, events. I have nothing but respect for the police. I've seen uh, bottles thrown, water bottles, frozen water bottles thrown at our police officers. I've seen them threatened. I've seen them, uh, I've, I've been spit on. I've seen a lot of things happen. And honestly, I don't think we've seen 
that many people hurt because of it. Our, our police are very restrained. The people that attend these rallies are pretty well restrained because there's not been any big brawls or fights or anybody hurt. And for, for the most part, it's because the, the citizens that are there to counter protest the, uh, the protesters are law abiding citizens. They expect the police to do their job and they stand there and, and they allow the police to do their job. Uh, they've, they've tried to tie the hands of the police in this city for a long time and it is so that they can have their way and do what they want to do and not respect the laws that we live by. Uh, I, I believe in the law, I believe in the rule of law, and I believe in our law enforcement. And I thank you for denying this petition. All right, uh, thank you very much, Williams. Let's see, next was uh, Manuel Saldana. Is he here? Yeah. Well, please, yeah, please come forward. And then followed by, is it Kamal Precht? Sahara, is that the correct pronunciation or close? All right, well, you introduce yourself when you come forward next. Okay, thank you. Mr. Saldana, good to see you. Hi, good to see you, Mayor, and the other members here. Um, I'm also a veteran uh, from here, from the uh, infantry unit of Arizona, did two tours. And uh, I just wanted to say I disagree with uh, Williams for saying that she was proud of what the police, the police did that day. Um, I'm, I'm not proud for what happened that day. And, Mr. Jim Waiting for telling everybody they thought they were smart for speaking out. I, I don't think you look smart talking about a, a war field if you've never been to one, all right? That day did look like it was a war field. And yeah, we do sign up and we get thrown in a tear gas, but we sign up and we do it to defend the people that are in the city. And that's what you say you're gonna do, police chief. You all were talking about how you're supposed to protect one person that's gonna come here. Well, protect that person. And also, what about all the thousands of people that were hurt? When I walked away from that place, there was people with crutches being pushed. Um, there was people that were, there was kids coughing. What about all those people? You were all talking about that one person. What about all those American citizens that were there? There's two things that we talk, there's other things that we talk about in the military. One of them is escalation of force. That's something you failed that day. And that's something that my veteran brothers know. And also collateral damage. I was at the, at the Arizona Center and there was people there coughing at the Hooters and all those other places, families that didn't know what they were doing, what about their protection? What about all them? You said there was 14 and those those instances have been used to protect people uh, like other cities like Baltimore. I didn't see violence there. The only violence I saw was coming from the police. 14 people had to be stopped. There was thousands, hundreds of people hurt. Thank you for listening to me and I hope you keep doing what you're supposed to do and that's protect people by not using these weapons and, I, and going and doing collateral, uh, collateral damage like that. Thank you, y'all. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Ms. Saldana. <laughs> Council Warren, did you have a comment or question? So just a clarification, I never said anybody shouldn't protest. That is certainly your right. You do it peacefully. I would say the police did a pretty good job managing the situation, to say the very least. The behavior here has been egregious. So if you think that shouting down people from the audience and so forth so they can't speak to myself, in any way is something you should be doing, you might want to recalibrate. Um, Mr. Rafferty asked, do we have rules? We do, we're not following any of them, but we do have them. You're violating them every time you shout out and shout somebody down and don't go up to the microphone, which we're all, I think, sitting here willing to listen. So it's not like you're not getting a fair hearing. Uh, is that offensive? It is, but there's no way saying you shouldn't go out and protest and, and do your thing about policies you don't agree with. That is not what I said at all to the last speaker's comment. Thank you. All right. Ms. Sada? My name is Komopri Kar Sahota, and I'm happy you're speaking, Councilmember Waring, I believe it's pronounced, because what you did was childish, to target a group of folks who were, went through tear gas who have been harmed. Tear gas has not been tested to see the long-term effects, so we do not know the long-term effects of tear gas. That was said several months ago when the medics came here and spoke to you, complaints that you are continuing to ignore that when we all came here back in like September now. And so to come at a group of folks who are here who are concerned about their safety, not just that night, but in the future, because just like someone said, the police force will use tear gas again and again and again, unrestricted because of the behavior of this city council. And so your behavior was childish to target us and not to be targeting folks behind me who you seem to be siding with, who have called us illegal aliens, not knowing our citizenship status or our histories of trauma, who have said comments that have targeted us 
directly and derogatorily, who have done acts of aggression against us at different actions. You supported them. The fact that you are opposing the idea of not using chemical weapons that are not used in war on our streets, the fact that you oppose trying to do that is ridiculous. And on top of that, the police chief to say that the only op other options if we don't use tear gas is to get dogs and stun guns on us as a threat? That is horrendous, and that should be addressed. Why are we being threatened of our safety when we were peacefully protesting? Numbers were given, contact information was given for the police to contact us when they needed us to disperse. Those methods were not used. We used every method possible to make sure the police was aware of what was happening, and thousands of people were harmed anyway. The police force is not here for us, and us, I'm being very clear, because it's here for you. The folks who are speaking, it's here for you, particularly because you are white. All right, ma'am. And we Thank know you. systematic racism. We know how long it's been standing. Oh, and I, I see that you're not chastising them for talking at me. Thank you. Um, but the behavior, okay. time's up? Time's up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, fair enough. All right, thank you very much uh, for that testimony. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that was a fair characterization of the point that our chief was trying to make. I'll give the chief another chance to try to make the point about uh, why the, she, as the leader of the department, feels like this uh, should be in the toolbox, if you will. Chief Williams. So, Mr. Mayor, members of council, that is correct. What I was trying to articulate, that if that tool is not available for us to use, then there we will have to resort to other measures in order to control the crowd. All you have to do is call me. All right, thank you very much. All right, the next, how about Di Dawson? Is Di Dawson here? And then followed by uh, Milagro Renteria? Hi, it's Day. It's spelled phonetically on there for you. You've been here before. I apologize. Um, so, boy, again and again, we we find ourselves here before City Council, telling you to please contain your dogs, restrain your dogs. They're hurting people. We've got a police chief who's clearly complicit. We have a council who likes to talk in a way that maybe they sound like they're supporting the people because you guys have elections coming up, but. The proof is in the pudding, and we are still getting assaulted by police. Phoenix police have the number one kill rate in the United States, 2015, 2016, 2017. Get a harness on your dogs. So, oh, in the article you keep mentioning, just so you know yeah. that roadblock. Ma'am, please, ma you, please direct your comments to, you. uh, to the council. Right, from March of, right, March of 2016. I miss uh, Milagro Renteria. Milagro, Renteria, please. And then followed by Karen Woods. Uh, hello, it's actually gonna be both of us. Please. Do you wanna go first? Um, my name is Milagros. Um, I'm 15, I'm a sophomore at South Mountain High School. Um, I'm here to say that illegal aliens isn't the right term. Um, second of all, I like, I'm proud to be the color that I am and I'm proud to be a Latina. And if they want to call us illegal aliens, then it doesn't matter to me. Hello, I'm Maria Gomez. I am 16. I am a sophomore at South Mountain High School. And all I have to say is I don't think it's right for kids to get tear gas because, like, there's been people that got hurt. Imagine your kids. Imagine if I was your daughter. Would you like somebody? hurting me of course not parents are supposed to defend their children like it or not they have their own opinion we we're okay with it that's your opinion but also let us say our opinion let's be open-minded for example me like i really do not like certain things but just because i don't like it i should not stay quiet i have a voice i need to be heard i am tired of having to deal with all this disrespect. I am, clearly I am an immigrant. I'm not from here. But does that, that does not give people the right to disrespect me. I have to walk into my community 
and have seen all these people disrespect me just because I'm not from here. I am a human. I have feelings. So please respect my feelings the same way as I respect yours. Thank you very much for that uh, important testimony. Did you more, please? Yeah. Um, they get double times. There's two of them there, so we don't get much time, please. Um, I feel that um, how she said, if we, everybody has their own opinion, there's freedom of speech. If we're against Trump, then we're against Trump. If they're for Trump, they're for Trump. But I feel like uh, them calling us illegal aliens isn't like for what it's disrespect we don't go over there calling them oh look at that white people over there look at them we don't do that we're not gonna give them names because they have names we're not gonna t like put them under a title because them giving us racism because of our color shouldn't even exist our color shouldn't matter and it hides who to them, it hides who we are, because our color to them, and they conclude, oh, they're illegal. They're di they, they just discriminate because they want to, because they feel like it, but they don't even have a reason to. All right, thank you for that testimony. We appreciate it. Karen Woods. Is Karen Woods here, please? And then followed by Adam uh, Rocha. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. This is coming down to the police department and how they responded on this occasion. I was there. I was at the protest. I was at the, at the rally. I witnessed from a bird's eye view coming out of the rally as to what we were going to be coming out to. And it was pretty, uh, it was pretty nerve wracking. You know, you have a lot of people out there screaming and banging things and someone have, have masks on. So we came out and I have to commend the chief of police. I think the police officers did an outstanding job that day. With what they had to contend with, I physically saw water bottles being thrown at officers. I saw the, 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 the lack of respect shown to the officers, to the people who have opposing views than they do. I did not see one person coming from that rally bothering anybody that was outside. It was the people who were out there protesting Trump that were attacking the people who were coming out of the convention center. The police showed great restraint as far as I saw, and I stayed to watch from a distance. I was extremely impressed. As a former police officer, I come from Baltimore. I know what it's like to be involved in very, very traumatic events in a major city. I was so impressed with the Phoenix Police Department. I have to take my hat off to them. And if you don't want to get sprayed with pepper spray, you do what you're told to do. You follow the law. You follow the law. If the police officer tells you they need your ID, you give them your ID. Police officer tells you to step back, you step back. You show some dang respect. And that's what's missing in this whole mix is respect. And I'm about sick and tired of it. The other thing I would like to mention just at the end, I am so sick and tired of the race being brought up. Do you know, I don't look at people at what color they are, and illegal is not a race. Illegal is a status. I know illegal, right. re I know illegal okay. residents that come in here from all different countries and all different colors. It has nothing to do with race. I right, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Woods, for that testimony. Mr. Rocha. Do you want to provide testimony? And then Maria Gomez. I'm, like I said before, I'm a retired uh, first sergeant and uh, 22 years. You know, I don't know how long these veterans that we're talking about have been in there, but uh, they, weren't, they weren't taught uh, um, leadership, uh, especially this young lady that says, they should have, that the police should have called her and she was going to control thousands of people. You know, they had, you know, I was there and we were at the gate making sure that everything stayed, uh, helping the police make sure that, that, that they stayed uh, calm over there. And then when the police said, okay, clear, clear the deal, we help people uh, go to their, to their vehicles. When I was trying to get out of there, 
Antifa and all these people that like to hang around with 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 them. They were over there. They stuck. They threw the first canister out, you know, and they they were out of control. So the police officers they put them on check, you know. They they uh, they uh, uh, got them uh, straight. And these guys are professionals. I trust them, you know. And if they tell me move, I move. These people are going to start uh, trying to get get uh, into their faces, and and uh, and I got rights and all that. Yeah, you got a right to when they tell you you move, you get out of the way. There's nothing, you know. You don't own this 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 uh, this state, this this city, anything. You know, you guys think that that. Uh, you know, this young lady says that she was she was able to control everybody. And Tifa was over there, and they're the actual ones that started, but they were there with them. And they, they say, well, I have to get into the building because of the CS and stuff. You know something? That CS was on, on, on Van Buren. It was on Van Buren. You know, there's no way that it traveled, you know, full strength all the way over there. You know. All right, thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate it very much. The two minutes are up. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yep. How about Maria Gomez will be the next speaker, followed by Miss Antone. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Thank you. Then how about Miss Antone, followed by Triana Miles? Hi. So really disappointed to have to be here for the third time defending the police officers for August 22nd. It's... You know, I've been up here three times. Three times I've been here in the city council. All three times have been to defend the police over one night where they did what should be the example for the United States of America and every single police force. Every single police force across the country should take lessons from the way Chief Brown run, Grant Williams ran that police force that night. We had to walk through the tear gas. We were totally peaceful. We had to walk through it. We had to, roads, they had roads blocked. We had to walk three and a half miles to get back a half a, a half a block to my car, which was parked at the Sheraton. Three and a half miles because people don't want to disperse. They don't want to follow the law. The same people that are saying our police shouldn't be able to use chemical warfare, their favorite tool is pepper spray. So they don't want it used, but they want to use it. And I would like to point out to the girls with the big crocodile tears who call me the Nazi and the KKK and the white supremacist, I'm not going to have big crocodile tears because I have a little bit thicker skin, but you don't like it, don't do it. So it's not one group against another group, picking, picking, picking. This is a continuous battle in this city right now, and I'm sorry, we do what the police ask us to do, and we are out there standing face to face against these same people a lot. And you know what the difference is? When the police ask me to do something, I do it. When the police ask the other side to do something, they do what they want. I didn't raise my kids to behave that way. I'm sorry that other parents feel that it's okay to raise kids to behave this way and to act like lawless people. But if you act like lawless people, that's what you're gonna end up with. Would, would people prefer that the cops just went to bullets? Should we just go to bullets? Is that the answer? You don't wanna get tear gas to be dispersed, so the next answer would be bullets? I mean, give me a break. That is non-lethal force. If I, am in a, if I am in a protest, that is the chance that I take. Thank you for your testimony very much. All right, Mr. Triana Miles is next. Thank you so much. And then followed by Bill Wood. My name is Triana Miles. I'm a sophomore at South Mountain High School, 15 years old. First things first, we have to protect the president, but we can't find ways to safely protect our citizens. You point out how they've only used it a few times, they shouldn't have to use it at all. Following the law doesn't mean anything when it comes to us so-called illegal aliens. I find it absurd how you talk about Puente as proud of hate, but you support Trump's hate. 
what you allow yourself to spew at things you can't even understand shows you are blinded by blissful ignorance. You think you know the reality, but you know nothing. Follow the law. Yeah, okay, but the police can't even follow the law and aren't being punished for their crimes the way we are punished for just standing or just speaking. Now please tell me again about following the law. Why does it only apply to us illegal aliens? If anything, you are the illegal aliens. This land is shamefully built on hypocrisy. What you're trying to preach is utter hypocrisy in itself. And don't tell me that we're supporting hate when you are the hate. And when you're supporting the hate, why is it that, the cr that we're criminals, yet we have had our freedom stolen under the name of this so-called law? And don't use it as an excuse because it only benefits you and has always only benefited you. It barely leaves a scratch on you, but will always scar us. You describe our actions as animalistic, so you can justify your unnecessary violence. Oh, you're sick and tired? I think not. I thank you very much, Ms. Miles. All right, Bill Wood. Is Bill Wood here? Oh, got it, okay, thank you. Mr. Wood? Okay, thank you again. I have to say that I was also there that night, and when the police officer told me, go this way or go that way, do not cross the street, we just followed his direction. We did what we were told. We were told to keep moving and, and to disperse and go on. We didn't linger, stay. We didn't try to cross lines that we were told not to cross, and I commend the police force. We were impressed at what went on. Like my wife said, we were from Baltimore. We see what happens in those places, see the destruction of property that happened in Baltimore because the mayor said, stand down, let them destroy. You have to do, take certain things into consideration they don't want pepper spray, but I'm sure that these, there's other people that don't wish to be hurt by thrown bottles or the violence that happens when they destroy property that has happened in other cities. And as been stated, it's non-lethal. It's the step that they need to take prior to using some kind of force and I don't believe this police force wants to use force. They don't want to go in there and beat people in the head. They don't want to do things that can cause the physical damage. So all I have to say is if you're there and the police officer tells you move on, don't go there, go there, that's what you do. And you don't get pepper sprayed when you listen to what the police officer says. You don't have to agree with them. And that's something you could take up later, but don't I think very disagree much. and follow the order. Mr. Wood, thank you for your testimony very much. All right, that's, that's all the cards I have on item number uh, 88. Please, Carlos, go ahead. I, I didn't have the card, but go ahead. No problem. Um, I guess I'm the brain surgeon that came up with this, this petition. Um, I, again, to, to talk about people not being impacted, the children, the, the elderly folks, and the community that, got, that were there, many of you were there early on and saw what a beautiful event it was, um, is, is ridiculous. I think the police department was out of control. The local police department, and it goes along with the, with the previous petition, did not have control. As we see the reports come out after both the, the Phoenix Police Department and their report uh, admitted to not being able to adequately let us know that, that, that to dis disperse. They did not ask, make that dispersal order until half an hour after. Um, and, and again, it was six hours of testimony that was put upon here um, by people from all over. It wasn't just our group, it was different folks that came here. And so we've talked about the Phoenix Police Department's behavior before. I think it's important to make sure that, and I know there was an opportunity to do an independent report and, and there was some discrepancies there, it didn't happen, but what we've seen with the Phoenix Police Department and the information that we've gotten through a FOIA request, 
there's a lot of inconsistencies. There is literally one officer who happens to be the training officer behind these chemical weapons who dispersed about half of the chemicals himself, literally being uh, the, the one that, and, and he also shot different types of weapons. I want you to look at the weapons, uh, the pictures that were given to you. Those are the weapons that were pulled out on our community, uh, whether there was bottle thrown or not. Um, our community was literally attacked by the Phoenix Police Department, and I hope you can, uh, with what we heard, that six hours of testimony and what you've heard today, make a decision that if this chemicals aren't okay to be used in war, they're not okay to be used on our own people. Thank you. I think Mr. Garcia. All right, so that, uh, that's all the testimony we have on this item. So the motion is to uh, deny the petition to the second council. Warren, do you have comments or questions on the item? Uh, to that last point, so first, I, I agree with your points about we have a citizen petition process, so we're going to keep hearing the citizen petition. You're right to do so. I'm not even sure there's any alternative, but, but I think that is accurate and just. No matter how we may consider it frivolous, other people may consider them important. I'm not passing judgment on that. Uh, my brain surgeon comment was to the one about the not protecting the president, not the number 88 that we're on, but that was number 87. That was a remarkably bad idea. We're still hearing it. I think we still listen patiently and, uh, and respectfully, because we weren't really shouting people down and so forth. Uh, but, but regardless, uh, somebody else made the comment earlier that perhaps my comments were only directed at one side of the room. That's not true. My comments are directed at both sides of the room. You shouldn't be shouting out, clapping, it's not a sporting event, interrupting other people, talking over them, period. That goes to all stripes. So whoever misinterpreted my comments, I'm sorry I wasn't clear. I hope that this was. Um, I, I do take umbrage at the speaker who got up, and I think my interpretation of her comments was that our police officers are dogs. It was said several times. That, that is just, I don't know what people are thinking. That does not win people over to your side. But hey, I could be wrong. Maybe it will at some point. To our officers who are here in the room and had to listen to that, I'm sorry that you did. And Chief, uh, we don't always agree. And, and Milton, we don't always agree. You oversee the Chief and, and certainly Ed. You and I don't always agree. But I, I have to say, um, you know, insulting the officers in a blanket statement after five minutes before complaining that you guys were being insulted by a blanket statement from the other side is, is uh, I found that a curious way to handle things. But I do, this has come up several times before, people grabbing microphones, we had a meeting that went on forever, all decorum was lost, and, and it's just, it's hard to sit here and listen to it. It's, um, we're willing to listen, we're here, I'm willing to listen, I'm here, I heard every word, sat in this chair, but I, I don't think the officers should be compared to dogs. Yes, some probably make mistakes. Some probably don't do as well as others. Some, as we know, because it's happened, commit crimes and get arrested and go to jail. It does happen. Uh, but, but I'm proud of our officers. I am proud of the job they did that night. You guys disagree. I respect your opinion to disagree and to verbalize that. You don't like it. Well, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. But uh, when I illustrated things, I said before, <laughs> no loss of life no permanent injuries, no property damage. There aren't a lot of cities that can claim that all around the world, not just in the United States. So I think that is a testament to the leadership did a good job, at least on that night, uh, that the officers are well-trained. And uh, you know they're not getting rich doing this. They probably got into it because they wanted to serve. I, I applaud that. Um, I applaud that initiative and that they're there. These are tough jobs. Anybody who's gone on a police ride along, and that's probably not most of the people in this room, uh, it is quite an eye-opener. Go out to some of these precincts. I've done it several times. Uh, it, it is not easy. It's extremely stressful. And for them to maintain the self-control and the dignity they did on that night, I, I think is uh, commendable. Uh, there was a uh, editorial in the, I think it was an editorial, in the Arizona Republic, Phil Boas. I don't know how many people saw it. I don't always read it, but I, I did see this one. Um, I don't need to go on and on. You can just read that article and I would associate myself with, I think, just about every comment that was in there. And I appreciate the fact that, that he took the time to wrote that and the paper printed it. I don't always agree with what they do. But I thought that was well earned by the chief and, and her department. And uh, I just think they, they are owed it. Thanks. So I appreciate it, uh, officers who are here. Thank you. I thank you, Council Warren. And I'll turn to the other members of the council for comments or questions that they may have. Again, the motion is to deny the citizen petition. There is a uh, second. Um, 
I'll, I'll do that. I will be supporting the, um, uh, the motion. Uh, we have an excellent Phoenix Police Department. It's not a perfect department, uh, but, a, but a great department as they are is willing to learn. Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion about what happened the night of uh, the uh, Trump political rally and the, what happened uh, afterwards as people were expressing their First Amendment rights. And the chief said she was going to do an after action report and did acknowledge ways that we have to improve uh, if there ever were similar type incidents. And so we're going to learn this lesson and improve. But that's actually not what's on the, on the, what the motion is. The motion is whether or not we should outlaw the, the tools, totally outlaw those tools that were used that night. I think the chief made the point that, um, that the use of those is not the preferred op option, but some of the other, if, if you take that away, the, the other options may actually cause more harm. So I will not be supporting outlawing those tools from our, our, our Phoenix uh, Police Department. For those reasons, I'll be supporting the motion. Councilman, you had a comment or question? I do. Um, thank you, Mayor. I think we work very hard to build a safe community and one that's open. I appreciate the people who were li willing to listen to people, especially people with whom they really disagree. There was some language, I think, on both sides that were, was not helpful. These are really important issues and we should have an open and honest debate. At the time, we looked at having some individuals, some experts from the Obama Department of Justice do an outside review. I supported that. The city council and the public did not go with that option. Um, these are very technical issues, and it would be very helpful from my perspective to have some real expertise in looking at these issues. I look, in this particular case, at, at Berkeley's example. Berkeley is often talked about as the birthplace of the free speech movement and the fact that their very progressive council decided that they wanted to still have this option is important to me. I hope that we never need to use it, but if we want to have a safe city, we ought to protect and have the options. We need to continuously look at what we can do better. That's one of the things that makes Phoenix Grace and certainly a commitment of mine. We can always do better and we um, are not perfect, but hopefully we can have a respectful dialogue. We ought to be looking at cities that people in this room think are doing a good job, what, what's working well elsewhere, what are model policies that have led to safe communities. We want to take the best ideas from other communities and, and continuously improve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions, member of the council? Council Nowakowski, please. Mayor, I was actually there at the, um, at the rally and I was walking around for about three or four hours and I left about seven o'clock, but when I was walking around, I seen young people from both sides offering water. I mean, one of the things that these individuals here are, they know protests, they know marches, they know that they need to have ice cold water when it's close to 100 degrees temperature. People that were coming to the rally really didn't realize that they were gonna be standing for two to three hours in a line without any water. And what was so, I call beautiful great about it is that you had these individuals handing water over to the opposite side. Yes, I actually witnessed it not just once, not just twice, but many times. The rally was a great rally. It turned out to be nice that people had their, their grounds and they were able to protest in a peaceful manner. And I'm not sure what happened, but what I seen was our police officers working together with both sides, working together with our community action officers to make sure that they had communications with all the different groups. And at the end of the rally, I'm not sure if it was some outsiders or individuals that came in and created chaos. But at the same time, what's happening in this room here is chaos too. The name calling with our officers, that's not right. I take an oath, we all take an oath up here to basically support everyone for any walk of life. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or the language that you speak. We represent all of you. When the chief takes that oath, she does the same thing. It's not her opinion if she likes somebody or if she doesn't like somebody. If somebody's getting abused by their spouse, they, the police officer has to go in there and protect both individuals, no matter who's in right and who's wrong. I believe the police chief was doing her, her job to the best of her abilities, and it's sad that we start to point fingers. I believe what we need to do is actually have a conversation. We need to actually sit down and figure this out. At this time, I believe that 
this isn't the place to have that type of conversation as the um, chair of the public safety subcommittee. Um, some of my colleagues have approached me to see if there's a way that maybe you can bring some of this information to light at our subcommittee meetings and we can have a, a discussion there and to shine some light on some of these issues that were addressed and the reasons why we do the things we do. And I think once again, I'd like to thank you all for the respect, but at the same time, the language that was used here and calling our police officers dogs was not appropriate and calling individuals illegal aliens, that's not, that's not appropriate. Undocumented maybe, but not illegal aliens. That, so undocumented, I'm not gonna argue with please, you. Yep. But anyways, floor, please. the bottom line is that we need to have a forum where we respect one another. And I'd like to thank the chief once again for her hard work and, um, and maybe we can actually create that information <laughs> section during um, the subcommittee to iron this out. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Any other comments or questions by members of the council? Okay, there's a motion, there's a second. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Noah Kowski. Yes. Stark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Uh, yeah, so the motion passes unanimously. Next item on the agenda is item number 89. Item number 89 is consideration of citizen petition related to the Seven Motor Inn, 2936, 2970 East Van Buren uh, Street. Are there cards on item 89? No cards, there are motion on 89. Council Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I make the motion to deny this petition. Um, this is not city owned property. I will tell you, I never thought I'd agree with this, but on item three uh, of the petition, I think it has some merit and I would like to have staff See if there is a way we could give appropriate notice if we're going to go in and uh, shut off electricity, at, at least to let them know it's pending. Uh, I think that's as far as our responsibility goes, but the motion is to deny the petition. Okay, so the motion is to deny the petition with note that item three of the petition, which concerns notice to residents in circumstances where we may have to shut down a residential building, we improve that process. Is there a second on that motion? Second. There's a second. Councilwoman Gallego, please. I chair the neighborhood subcommittee, and I think this would be an appropriate item for us to look at, to look at notification of the residents and, and come up with a good policy. That's great. Any other comments by members of the council? There's a motion. There is a second. Roll call. Okay. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Stark. Yes. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. So that motion passes unanimously, and that'll be heard before uh, Councilwoman Gallego subcommittee. Next is item number 90, uh, consideration of citizen petition related to the ethics commission application process. Does someone have a motion about how to dispense with item number 90? Mayor, I, guess I get to make these motions today. Uh, uh, I'm going to deny this application. I think it uh, should be referred back uh, for the committee. The JSAB. Yep. To research, see if we can find some more applicants and submit it to us. But I think the process is total is okay. So I'm denying this. Okay. The motion is to okay. deny, but to kick it back to the JSAB for uh, new recommendations relative to membership on the citizens ethics. Commission. There's a second. And a couple cards, please. Do you want to come forward and make a testimony? Ms. Barker? Huh. I, I can wait till after there. And then Mr. Clark is still here. Is he here? It's the first time we outlasted Mr. Clark. That's great. All right. <laughs> Where'd he go? Tell, someone go get him. He's still around. All right. Ms. Barker, please. Yeah, well, thank you. Good evening. Mayor and Council and uh, staff and the residing public. I'm Diane Barker in District 7, and I'm here to c clarify. Yesterday I got to speak at the sustainability. I think Councilman Waring and Stark and Gallegos were there, 
and I had just previously picked up the packet for city council, and so I'm marrying the item on sustainability, you know, 10, because, um, and I'm supportive of this, Kate Gallegos was recommending that there would be ethics of non-discrimination and anti-harassment policies for elected officials, board members, and volunteers, and I understand that's coming forth on your vote. But this item here on 90, and I'm making a statement on this because at that time I spoke on it and I said I didn't see a notice, a notice to the public on this because all of these allegations have to do that it was improper relating to the process for the Ethics Commission. I did speak with um, Karen Peters who apparently is responsible for this and I just said, well, I, there wasn't any notice. It looks to me like everything else is in order in alerting the public, but I do see there was an attachment. So it was just the information I was glancing at was no public notice. I do want to call your attention to the last paragraph is because they're saying the process has resulted in insufficient number of eligible candidates. So. That is something that it looks like will need to be done. And if you deny this, will that be done? You may want to speak with Mr. Zerker, our manager, about it. And also, I wanted to know, when the mayor convenes in interviewing these recommended candidates, will it be in public? You know, I, I, there's another process, I guess, to interview. Do you interview in public? Uh, we'll turn. I will deal with that. Check my legal counsel was required under our city um, uh, rules on that. Uh, my preference is to do it in public, certainly. Mayor, uh, yes, it would be an interview in public. It's similar to our practice with regard on the uh, chief presiding uh, judge and the other municipal court judges. It's a very right. similar practice. And answer the question. Thank yeah. you very much, Ms. Parker. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, well, thank you. There's a motion. Oh, a second. Councilman Waring, do you have a comment you. on it? So, so it's taken a while to get enough applicants. Uh, I'm just going to say, chance to put this on the record, the JSAB has done a terrible job in this circumstance. They forward, we were very clear. Uh, we spent a lot of time setting up the Ethics Commission. Um, we were very clear. I, I believe it was Stella Williams' motion, but I could be wrong. We weren't going to have elected officials. We weren't going to have precinct committee people. Um, they sent somebody who was both in the first round, and not to be outdone, they did it again in the second round. It makes me wonder what they're looking at, how much review they are doing. I, I assume none at all, given that, you know, just quick Facebook checks or anything would have revealed this. Um, it's very frustrating to me, so if there is another group, I don't, I don't know how that would work within the context of what we voted on in the past, but if there's another group that could select and bring Africa, this is not the fault, I, I should add, of the mayor or anybody up here. It's not our fault. We're not picking the candidates. They are sent forward by the JSAB. But, you know, once it maybe is a mistake, twice, I, I don't understand it. There was also a stipulation. We're going to have two Republicans, two Democrats, and Independent. My understanding was just like the Independent Redistricting Commission at the state, you didn't want somebody who just switched from Democrat to Republican yesterday. So. So you're supposed to go back and check five years. Did that happen with each of the applicants? Karen? Well, can I? Sir, may the, I go to that point? To that point, who does that vetting? Is it the JSAB or the question, the staff? Do they hire people? I mean, what are yeah, they? I mean, Ms. Peter, but this it? is a new process, by the way, so it's a, yeah, new, it's a new first time we're going through it, so we're, we're learning together. Ms. Peter, how can we improve the process yes. moving forward? Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So this is the first instance in which the Judicial Selection Advisory Board had this responsibility. As they do with judicial candidates, they take it upon themselves. It is their responsibility to vet candidates. Staff did work with each of the candidates to determine the length of their voter registration to make sure that they had been registered continuously for five years in whatever appropriate uh, uh, category they were in. But the mayor, may I ask, is that a way of saying you took their word for it? I'm not saying you shouldn't. I mean, was that what you did? At least one of the applicants, mayor, lived out of state until relatively recently. Did you call the other state and find out how they were registered? Anything? 
Mayor, Mayor uh, Councilman Waring, we, we did inquire of the candidates what their voter registration okay. was. There was not uh, a calling around to confirm voter registration. Okay, and we can, again, that's we a little concerning. We can add that as we, as we uh, continue in this process. Vice Mayor. So we have these guidelines and stipulations. We're not following them. I'm not, yeah. I'm just lost for words at this moment as to why we did not follow through in determining not only their registration, how long they were registered, uh, when did they register, um, because that would be t determined by the registration. If you go to the Maricopa County, uh, if you work with the Maricopa County elections, uh, they will be able to assist on that. Uh, secondly, um, there are one Republic, I mean, two Republicans, two Dems, and an independent. Uh, you would be determined if you worked with the parties, they would have been able to determine if they were precinct committee people, if they were elected. Um, so I don't know what to say at this moment, uh, but we're not even following what we voted. I mean, we voted on something for staff to implement and follow. And that's a little disturbing to me. Um, secondly, uh, and I think it goes back to the list that we received, and the list we received as to these following people have been recommended by the JSAB, uh, ranking them. Um, and then as they were chosen, the background check or the, the pieces then started to move and uh, then were chosen to be part of the ethics committee. And then all of a sudden they couldn't be part of the ethics committee, committee due to a number of things. So to me, that is very embarrassing to know that uh, there are people in this process that get to the end and then not told that they were no longer part of the committee. So, and what I mean by not told is that they arrive here and then they're told. It's embarrassing. Mayor, members of the council, I agree that there were errors in the process. Again, this was the first instance that the Judicial Selection Advisory Board uh, in endeavored to do this job. They did spend a lot of time talking to references and doing other checks, but obviously insufficient insofar as confirming precinct committeeman status, uh, as, as we have d learned. Mayor. Councilman, please. Another concern is the majority of the individuals came from one district that was actually District 6. I think it needs to be spread out throughout the whole city so we have, a, we have diversity, not just with race, but just geographically, where you have people from the south, east, north, and west being represented equally, too. So I think that's something I'd like to see done. I'm not sure if we're stuck with this process of going through the um, JSAB or if there's another process that we can actually use, or is there suggestions from us? As, I'm not sure, but I think we need to take a step back and kind of figure this out, because it is embarrassing having individuals show up and then they get very angry and mad and that they even want to create a petition to actually um, to voice their anger at us. And it's not really my colleagues sitting up here, it's the whole process that that they're, they're involved with. Mayor, members of the council, Please. I would just uh, add that it is staff's recommendation that we go back and solicit new names. And so I would encourage everyone to go out into their districts and put forward uh, individuals that you would like to have considered um, so that we can, we can come back with a to more that diverse point. Uh, candidates list. Council Warren, to that point. So I, I don't think the issue is, we, we had enough citizens it's the group that made the selection that is the issue. We have issues with the JSAB. At least that's what I'm hearing from my colleagues. That's certainly my issue. One of the applications, it actually said, I am a PC, like right on the page. Did they even read it? It's like a two-page application. 
it was like the only thing in that block of like his stuff. I felt bad when asked later, you know, what was the deal? I'm like, well, <laughs> you're ineligible. You always were. And they never told me that. I put it on my application. You did? <laughs> there it was. I didn't know how he came by this information, but now I know. That's, that's just kind of silly. And to the, to the point that's been made, and that's to the, to the point, you know, you're talking about like this is some new group who's picking people for the first time. This is the people who selects our judges, correct? Okay, that doesn't inspire tremendous amounts of confidence. I gotta tell you that. If they're not interested in doing this work, let's find another group to do it. If they are interested, then they need to get more personally involved in their work. If anybody from that group wants to come and debate me on this like the last group did, like tell me I'm wrong, I'm not sure how they're gonna do that. That, that it is embarrassing, and it has been embarrassing. And people show up here thinking we're gonna vote on them, and then we don't, and they were ineligible the whole time. All their time was wasted. So, do as you will. I mean, if this is the thing, this is the thing. If there is an opportunity today, I guess we'd have to ask legal to pick another group to send us members. I'm, I'm certainly willing to listen to that, so thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I was on the Maricopa County Trial Court Selection Commission, so I, I, I was on it since 1999 to 2016. Um, we had a very extensive application. There were 77 questions, and it was like, yeah, I know, I understand. But one of the things that staff did do to help us, because it was a task to go through all those applications, is they kind of put together a matrix of important things to, to note number of jury t trials, things like that. Maybe if, if we could help um, the advisory board with some kind of matrix that perhaps has some of that information. And again, I, I'm not questioning how hard they work, but I think sometimes it is a daunting task, so maybe if there's some way staff could help with some kind of matrix. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to discuss how we review it again, but I will tell you just my experience on a judicial commission, it's a lot of work. Are they very much, Vice Mayor? So one of the things in uh, being part of a large committee, because I think this is a great example that Councilwoman Stark uh, brought up, is that when I'm part of a, a vetting uh, committee or uh, looking at presidents of a community college, uh, staff gets those applications and they vet them. They have a matrix that says PC, yes. Uh, register to vote, yes. What year were they registered to vote? Whatever the year is. If there is a no or a yes or however it looks like, then they're weeded, they're weeded out. So by the time the JSB, JS. I think it's JSBA or AB or whatever, uh, AB. AB, then has, it's been, it's been looked at and pretty much clean. Because they don't really know um, in the process, uh, they, know, they know they have to look at certain things and that should be given to them. They go through a check and then there's a third check through the vetting process to then double, really triple check to see how we, how we vetted everything by the time those names move up. By the time those names move up, they should be clean, clear, um, in front of us, and there are no issues. And if there are issues, they're pulled way before they're given to us. And so I think if we go back and look at HR, <laughs> Uh, uh, department policy, they probably can give us a process of how they go about looking at applications and everything else, but I think some process needs to come into play. All right, thank you very much. Any other comments? So the motion is to deny the petition and kick it back over to JSAB uh, for new names with obviously the uh, polite comments on how to improve the um, um, research on the, uh, on, the, on the names of people who may move forward before this council. That is the motion. Councilman Okowski, please. Mayor, do we have to run it through the um, JSAB or is there another committee or is there another process? Because I think three strikes are out. It's kind of 
All right, I, I see it looks like our city attorney wants to address that. I, I believe that is something that we voted on to, to assign this particularly to the JSAB after much review on uh, who the, you know, who the appropriate entity would be to select who we have, who we have confidence in that would provide the right uh, uh, people. And by the way, I think no one's questioning the, the quality of the people that were submitted as individuals. The question is whether they met the technical uh, requirements. One individual happened to be elected official and PC. Another person, I think, had, there was issues relative to how long they had been with a certain political party or whatever. So, but, but no one was questioning that these weren't good quality people, but, but the rules have to be followed that we set up. Mr. Holm. So, Mayor, members of the council, um, you're exactly correct that in the ordinance itself, the JSAB is selected as the um, review organization or the review board that determines or proposes names then for the council's consideration. So you'd have to change the ordinance. But you, of course you can do that. You can enact changes to the ordinance and establish another board. But currently that's the system set up in the ordinance. All right, Councilman Wary. So just, just to be clear, they submitted some names. One of the people is an elected official and a PC. That's where my terrible comment comes in. I didn't say it the first time. And I totally agree with your comments, by the way, about the applicants. Right, it's the not the people, applicant's right. fault. It's not our fault. It's not your fault. Um, so, okay, we tried to handle that diplomatically. But I, I'm not sure everybody's aware. The next batch, they sent another precinct committeeman. I, I don't, yeah, see, that, that's just it. It's not like I'm being a jerk because I'm, you know, I said be polite to this group. Now I'm being mean. No. The second time, you know what the issue was the first time. The guy apparently put it right on his application and you still sent it to us. Okay, that's not me being impolite or a jerk or anything else. That's you not doing what you're supposed to do. If it's a lot of work and you don't want to do it, don't either sign up for the committee or we need to pick somebody else who wants to do it. I don't think that's an unreasonable statement on my part because it is frustrating and it does make us look a little silly um, to have people sitting here and then not vote and so forth. Again, it's not our fault, but, but it is not an optimal situation. So if there's some other route, I think we should take it. Okay, by the way, voting in favor of this today does not in, in any way stop if you wanna change the process or change some of the makeup of the committee itself. Uh, that, you know, if, if there, I will have to look at it, you know, whether terms are expired, et cetera. But okay, that's the motion. There's a second. Roll call. Gallego. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Dark. Valenzuela. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Mayor Stanton. Yes. Uh, that, yeah, that one passed unanimously. Uh, sounds like there'll be more discussion on this uh, uh, in other venues. We do have a few more citizen comments. Is Mr. Spangler still here? Did he have to leave? Hopefully he can come back at another time to provide citizen comment. Ms. Hilt Helton? Tab Tabitha Helton? Hopefully show the opportunity. Pascal, the floor is yours. Good to see you. You don't see me here. Well, I'm still here. Uh, would you, can you uh, wait here, Mr. Mrs. Um, Council, to hear my witness here? She has to leave, unfortunately, for, city, for important city business. So, but, but, okay. but, there, but, but a quorum is still present. We're legal. Who is? Oh, yeah. Please, go ahead. I give some exhibits to what, um, give it to you there, at, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, my concern is the same thing it was before with the, uh, the people across the road from me, Ricardo Soleil, at uh, uh, in May at um, 2017, you rule on what the uh, Ricardo Soleil have to do on that property in the lot that you uh, have uh, uh, approved for uh, R3 to P1. Uh, you still have all those violations, and now it's almost two years, and in two years' time, this guy here never did nothing to comply with the City of Phoenix ordinance. So therefore, uh, if you see the picture there, uh, that I give it to you there, not just to park on the, on the lot there illegally, but he take the street, you know, and uh, leave me locked up in my house. Now, I'll ask this council here to wake up a little bit 
and make that guy there to do what he's got to do it. He cannot park on that lot there because it's illegal there. Many things he have to do it. He didn't do it. So I think the city of Phoenix must use his labors, remove, remove that driveway in the uh, Philadelphia Street, close the back, and if they want to go on that lot, on that lot there, as you say, May uh, 10, to get, get go around through the uh, R5 zoning and go around the back to that lot in there. So I am uh, waiting for this council here to do something about it because I don't have to come here, to, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and councils, all the time. I'm a second tire. I am a t now well and healthy, and I think this council got to do something. I think as uh, Ricardo Salea, it should be punished or sanctioned some way to stop what he's doing. What he did, he went down to the uh, state of Arizona, a doctor's, um, uh, whatever it is, um, so they, they closed the, um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the office up on um, McKinley Street where they collected uh, food stamps and everything else, the access office, and they, all those people there coming going in front of my house. They start from 7 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock at night. I got no freedom at all. Now, what, I, what do you people intend for me to do? Do you think you got to do something about it? Or just to lock myself inside my house and do nothing? Now, the only thing you have to do something is to the city council here and the mayor to get at uh, city of Phoenix employees, go remove that driveway from there, close the uh, back uh, the fence in the alley, and you charge it, charge it to uh, Ricardo Saleo for all the expenses. Thank you very much. I'll submit it to our city clerk and the city management for the, the record. Uh, also, there is three a- uh, up. Yes. We have three minutes for last sentence. That's fine. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming down, Pascal. Appreciate it. There are no other citizen comments. The meeting is adjourned. Yes, but.